Ladies and gentlemen, the Mars on Earth conference is about to begin. I'm here with your co-host, Ms. Suttle. Leaders of countries, experts in various fields, science, technology, research and design, engineering, space exploration and policy making have all gathered here tonight to establish and further the common understanding and further develop the mankind's next vision to reach Mars. Together, we will bridge mankind's vision to reach Mars. Mars, Mars for, for everyone. everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Mars on Earth International Digital Conference. To everyone around the world tuning in, Happy New Year. 1st of January, very first day of the year. Everyone sets a new goal and they have full of enthusiasm. So this special day, Mars V team is ready to bring a new hope and new dream to all humankind. With the mission to connect mankind's vision to reach Mars, the Mars on Earth conference is ready to begin. We have compiled a very unique agenda comprising of numerous Mars and space research specialists and more. We have some incredible people joining us today, such as Dr. Robert Zubrin, one of the first individuals to promote Mars research and exploration. The man himself who put the idea of Mars in some of the brightest minds in the world, such as Elon Musk, and Elissa Carson, officially announced by NASA to become the first human to set foot on the red planet. Other individuals such as Yannicka Mikkelsen and Gavin Gillet who are advocating to revolutionize the mining industry setting it into space to further decrease our resource depletion right here on Earth. And foreign ambassadors to Mongolia, international and national leaders also going to participate in our conference. Starting from mankind's vision to reach Mars to the Mars generation and finally, digital transition and beyond. Without further ado, I am pleased to invite Mr. Irtenbold Suchbater, founder of Mars V Project. The first time I was in the country, I was in the country, European Hotbo, Japan, Mung Arabian Sing Emirat, Mash Odom of Sutin Hold, Ursting, Mars Hutbrot Arsumbara. Mars Hutbrot Arsling at the Gold, Sansering Edin Six, Sansering Tilting, Toshin Tausland, Hunturton, Orton or Genox Smok. Unhir, Ischim Huchni Hold, Hunstigilian Hold, Tirosni Hold, Tishirtons Hammerling Munbara. In Uit, Bit Ishli Hirkin Hamgathwe, Ishli Nutik Hirtirik, Urushta Sartwe. Magatu Unik, Sheet Hin told, Sansarin the Hundogic, Ning Idruch, Tunig Andril, it insect, Urashtagar, Hirgitkin, Hundrushkin, the rest of Sima. Mongolian Hold, Marsing, in Tom or Sultan, or Stuxwak, Pazunstayo. Bid Urtung Izukitich, Bid Urto Akatsumbish, Toxung a Chagan Uret, Marsing Urston or Pazunstayo. In a Sultan Tarot Hent told, Bid Marsweet Stick, Sanat Sima. Happy New Year to all around the globe who are joining our international conference. Ladies and gentlemen, the creation of artificial intelligence and space technology has massively increased the development of the human race. Faced with the currently growing issues of resource depletion, we can look towards to the use of technology and innovation to solve issues of water, food and energy. With the discovery of groundbreaking tech and scientific discoveries, the age of space has opened up to the world more than ever before. Pathing to global cooperation and a glaring opportunity of global prosperity. With the ambition to join this effort of development, the Mongolian Aerospace Research and Science Association has been established to connect mankind's 
vision to reach Mars. The Mongolian Gobi Desert is a treasure that is unique. With its various environments and distinctive location, it is Mars on Earth. We're using this resource, the process of space and Mars exploration can be accelerated. While Mongolia has existed without rich historical roots to the world, the Mars We Project is an opportunity to once again lay the basis for the future. And we are giving Mars We Project to the world to open up new possibilities for cooperation and growth. The participation of President of Mongolia and the government of Mongolia, the leading specialists on space and Mars exploration, astronauts who will write history, representatives of public and private organizations who are joining us to share their knowledge for the progress of man must be commanded. The Mars on Earth conference is a small example of global cooperation to further the progress of space exploration and research. Ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to announce the launch of the Mars on Earth International Virtual Conference. Mars on Earth International Digital Conference, Mars V. Now, you know the most amazing part about space activities and research is that when it comes to space research, exactly, you're always participating in international cooperation. Especially nowadays. <laughs> Especially nowadays. And with that being said, when most space actors are participating in space activities and research, whether it's on the state level or the private level, they're always in multilateral cooperation. Yeah, and uh, speaking of state levels, we are very happy that the president of Mongolia, Hasmagin Batulak, is eagerly supporting the Mars V project. And he actually went to the Gobi with uh, Mars V members to be introduced to the location where the analog stations are to be built. Yeah, and not only that, the Mongolian president himself has introduced the Mars V project its numerous state leaders from US, Russia, and India, which Such an just honor. exactly, which just goes to show the amount of support the state is showing us to this amazing project. And uh, by the way, uh, we, while we were at the Gobi with the president, we made a video. Shall we check it out? Let's take a look. All right. Mars Gargi, Hundur Lukhtum Yitzum Shikh, Husil Timudin Dor, Shinjil Huang, Hegni Tikhinto Hutsum, In Taiwit, Bagel, Ichtik Higan, Hatrich, Harutsum. Hamar Chisum bit Tukumurge Biluja Ulto Hasuktuch Zondan Nimktu Churtel Halte Irstis Nuxin Mongolian Gavi Urmuts Uchur Bitul Motsli Hever Hatrasar In Tabuta Zotojana Archilog Hagentolog Tuk Soydirinstein Olongot Motsot Sotlitz Tabutan Ich Koin Hanikta or Survey Wow, the video looks so amazing. I thought it was filmed in studio. No, what can I say? That is Mars. That is the Gobi. It's such a unique treasure that the world holds, you know. That's why we're saying it's one of the best places to prepare for Mars exploration and essential researches. Yeah, as you said, we have a great resource of landscape and climate, but resources without any future plan and strategy is nothing. When you're trying to progress into the future towards success, Planning, planning, planning is always the best way. And without further ado, I want to invite Chief Cabinet Secretary Lofsan Amsrang Ayurden to the stage. I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about it. I'm going Дэлхийн олон орноос үзэл сонирхож буй та бүхэндээ энэ өдрийн мэндийг бүргээ. Мөн энэ таслыг 
санаачлагч Монголын сансрын судалгаа хөгжүүлэлтийн төвийн тэргүүн эрхэм нөхөр эрдэн олд түүний нөхдөд чин сэтгэлээс татархал илэрхийлээ. 21-р зуун бол өндөр хурдны технологийн эрэн зуун. Хиймэл оюун ухааны хөгжил сансрын технологийн үе юм аа. Монгол улсын хувьд өнгөрсөн 30 жилийн өгнөж шинэ 30 жилийг тодорхойлсон Алсын араа хоёртой бодлогын баримтчгийг Монгол улсын их хурлаас баталж хэрэгжүүлж байгаа. 2021 он бол энэ жилийн бодлого хэрэгжүүлж эхлэх хамгийн ихний жил юм. Монгол улсын засгийн гадраас мэдээлэл технологи цахим хөгжлийг эдийн засгийн тэргүүлэх чиглэл болгон анх удаа зарлаж төрөөс бүх хотод төрийн үйлчлэгийг цахим шилжүүлэх ийм Монгол хөтөлбөрийг өнөөдөр бид нэр амжилттай хэрэгжүүлж одоогийн байдлаар одоо 380 орчим төрийн үйлчлэгийг амжилттай нэгтгээд байна. Ийм төрийн бодлого илүү шуурхай, ил тод хүн сурталгүй байх шийдлүүдийг гаргаж чадна гэдэг нэгтэлтэй байна. Сансар судлалын хөгжлийн талаар ч гэсэн бид томоохон зөрилтийг гурван үе шаттай төвчүүлж байгаа юм. Ихний үе шатанд сансрын технологиг судлан, шинжлэх, эзэмших, ашиглах, дэд хүчтэйг бэхжүүлэх, сансрын технологид суурилсан үндэсний бүтээгдэхүүн үйлчлэгийг бий болгохыг бид нар ихний зөрилд гэж үзэж байгаа. За хоёрдугаар шатанд сансрын холбооны үндэсний хиймэл дагуулын сүлжээг бий болгох, үндэсний харилцаа холбооны сүлжээний ашиглалт хяналтын менежментийг хөгжүүлж олон улсын төвшөнд хүргэх ажлыг бид нар хоёрдугаар шатанд тодорхойлж байгаа юм аа. За гуравдугаар шат бол 41-ээс 20 одоо 50 онд бид сансрын технологийн тусламжтайгаар байгалийн амжилтаас сэрэмжлүүлэх систем, хилийн болон газар нутгийн хяналт, болсорл эрүүл мэндийн зайны үйлчлэгийг хөгжүүлэх, улс орны эдийн засаг аюулгүй байдал, бизнесийн өөрчлөлт чадварт үр хөгжиж бий болгох зорилтыг гуравдугаар шатанд бид нар тус тус тавьж байгаа юм аа. Монгол улс дэлхийн хөгжлийн ирээдүйн чиг хандлагад нийтсэн алсын араатай бодлогыг хэрэгжүүлэхийн тулд сансрын технологид суурилсан шинэ гарааны компаниуд сансрын аялжуучлалын загварчлал, сансрын хөгжүүлэлт, гадаадын улс орнуудтай хамтран хиймэл дагуул хөөрг хөрөнгө оруулалтын хамтын ажиллагааг бүх талаар дэмжин ажиллахад бэлэн байгаа илэрхийлж байна. Марс төслийн тухай өнөөдрийн энэ хөх хурал Монгол улсын сансрын бодлого хөгжүүлэлтийн түүхэнд онцлог нэгэн чухал үйл явдал болон үйлдэж байна гэдэг итгэлтэй байна. Сансрын бодлого цаашд улам бүр гүнзгэрийн хөгжлийн нөрөөл төвшүүлж Монгол улсын ерөнхий сайдын нэрийн өмнөөс болон сансрын үндэсний комиссийн дарга явуу та бүхэндээ ажлын амжилтсан яа. Mars and Earth International Digital Conference Mars V You know it's amazing how much support the Mars V project is getting nationally and internationally and to be honest I'm so happy to be part of this project Me too me too I'm so happy to because I met so many amazing people during exactly. the preparation of the conference and one of those people is ambassador of India to Mongolia So ladies and gentlemen, it is our privilege to invite Mr. MP Singh. San Beno, good afternoon. Namaskar. It is indeed a pleasure for me to be joining you all virtually for this prestigious event organized by Marsa. My warmest felicitations and greetings to the energetic team of Marsa ably led by my friend Eden Bold. I have had the pleasure of personally interacting with most members. And I can say that their perseverance, patience, persistence and enormous energy level inspire me to no end. Their genuine enthusiasm and keen eagerness to develop and promote the use of space science for betterment of Mongolian nation and its wonderful people is simply commendable. I'm particularly pleased to note that the Mars on Earth conference is being held shortly before the 40th anniversary of the astronaut Garucha's the first Mongolian and the second nation sojourn in space and after the decommissioning of Mongolia's first ever satellite Mazalai in May 2019 which brings added uh, significance to this event uh, announcement of the Indian government to allow Indian private players and startups in Indian space sectors encouraged uh, a group of young researchers from Mars who also accompanied president Batulga for his state visit to India in September 2019 to open negotiations with the Indian space scientists at the world renowned ISRO or called Indian Space Research Organization a premier uh, agency for manufacture service provider and technology developer in the space sector during their fruitful and productive exchange of ideas they also explored the possibility of launching the second mongolian satellite into the space and we are working towards it i hope the agreement in the space cooperation signed between Mongolia and India in September 2019 and the deliberations in the conference will fructify into closer cooperation between ISRO and CETA and also with the Marsa 
I'm sure that efforts of the Mars team would be ably complemented by about 225 Mongolian space scientists, professionals who have been trained in ISRO during the last two decades, and half of which are women. Friends, India's achievement in the space sector need not be overemphasized. Since the launch of its first satellite, Arabata, 45 years ago in 1975, India has continued its successful journey in space with aplomb. On November 6, to be precise, amidst COVID-enforced environment, India successfully launched Earth Observation Satellite EOS-01, as well as nine more satellites from the customer nations on board PSLV C-49, taking its total tally of launches of satellites and spacecrafts to an astonishing 199. Where what makes it unique is that ISRO operates on a shoestring budget of just about $1.2 billion dollars as compared to the NASA annual budget of about USD 22.6 billion, China Space Agency USD 11 billion, and the Eurospace Agency's annual budget of USD 7.43 billion. ISRO and its commercial arm Anthrix, and uh, they are exceptionally strong in technical and uh, through efficient technological capabilities offer services at hugely competitive cost. To cite an example, in September 2014, India successfully launched its Mangalyaan mission in the red planet Mars in the very first attempt after a complex 10-month voyage. What was more remarkable in this was the amazing feat was carried out at about just US dollar 74 million or 25 percent less than the cost of Hollywood movie Gravity which had a budget of about 60, uh, 100 million dollars. To allow better perspective of US Mars mission uh, cost USD uh, 670 billion, uh, 671 million, and the Eurospace mission cost was uh, 200 billion. The fact that till 2019 December, India has launched a total of 319 satellites for 33 different nations, including 104 Indian satellites, speaks volumes of ISRO's strength and admirable journey that continues unabated. In the next two years, ISRO plans to launch 36 more missions, including manned mission to Moon Chandrayaan and to uh, uh, the Red Planet Mars. I invite Mongolian Space Agency uh, to join hands and I invite uh, Mars to join hands uh, with ISRO and I'm genuinely sanguine that this conference and the framework provided by the 2019 uh, space agreement between India and Mongolia will pave the way for development, intensification and strengthening of space sector in Mongolia. The program content of this conference reflects the commitment and desire of young Mongolian researchers to engage with the global experts in consolidating the gains made so far by their organization Mars in the space sector and to carry forward their favorite mission Mars on Earth project in Gobi. I wish you success with your conference and of which I'm very sure I will see so much more fruitful discussions. Thank you very much and all the very best. Happy New Year to you. Mars and Earth International Digital Conference. Mars V. Mankind's vision to reach Mars. You know, our current era of space exploration, our space era, will be defined by whether we get to the red planet or not. It will be our next giant leap. And uh, you might ask, why go to Mars? What is the purpose of Mars exploration? Well, we're going to need a lot more time. But of in course. short, if you know, in the sense from movies and uh, predictions, if humans want to become a multi-planetary species, obviously Mars is the next step. And Dr. Robert Zubrin, president and founder of Mars Society, has helped build uh, several analog stations throughout the world, which receives analog trainees every year. And not only that, Dr. Zubrin is one of the first people on Earth to advocate for man to go to Mars. Joining us from Colorado, USA, Dr. Robert Zubrin. Hello, I'm Robert Zubrin. I'm president of the Mars Society. And uh, it's my pleasure to greet this uh, conference in Mongolia. Uh, I'm very supportive of the effort of uh, Mars VR to create a Mars analog research station in Mongolia. Um, you know, Mars is the challenge of our generation. Mars is the new world. It's the closest planet that has 
on it all the materials needed to support life and therefore civilization um, and we can reach it in our time and in my uh, book it's what our principal objective should be Mars is where the science is it, it, it, you know it's where the challenge is it's where the future is you know Mars is where the science is because it, early Mars was like Earth if Earth could evolve Mars, so could Mars, but did it? And if it did, did it evolve life that was the same as Earth life, or very similar to it, or something completely different? Um, this is the key for letting us know the truth about the potential prevalence and diversity of life in the universe. And we're only going to be able to find it out by sending human explorers to Mars. You know, Mars is where the challenge is, the, the great adventure. Youth loves adventure. and any country that participates in a Humans to Mars program would be sending its message to all its young people, learn your science and you can be part of the greatest adventure of all time. And you know, the United States doubled its science graduates during the Apollo program during because that was the message it sent. And in fact, I was one of those young people who went into science because of that. And many others did who did not end up in the space program, but they ended up doing the computer revolution, and biotech revolution. Help, advancing society in all kinds of ways and, and then it, it's where the future is it, it, it, you know if we do what we can do then you know 500 years from now there will not only be new branches of human civilization on Mars but there will be on thousands of planets orbiting other stars we, we when we go to Mars we're initiating a new phase of human existence as humanity as a spacefaring species. It, it's as significant a change uh, to the human uh, condition as when we first left the Kenyan Rift Valley where humans evolved to go out and settle Europe and Asia and eventually Australia and the Americas and become a global species with hundreds of nations. Okay, well we're going to become a spacefaring species with thousands of planets. Okay, and Mars is where it begins. But we need to learn how we're going to explore Mars. And the best way to do it is on Earth. Um, there are places on Earth where we can practice exploring Mars and figure out what's going to work and what isn't. Now, some people say, well, we need to do that on the Moon. Well, if we go to the Moon before we go to Mars, we can do that on the Moon, too. But we can do it on Earth right now. And even if we were on the Moon, we could do this on Earth at, you know, one thousandth the cost or less. So we're going to get a lot more practice from Mars missions in on Earth. And it is for this reason that the Mars Society has built two stations, one in the Canadian Arctic and one in the American desert. Uh, we call them Mars Analog Research Stations, where we can practice Mars missions. And people who have uh, gone through our program have gone on to establish additional stations in Hawaii and Israel and Poland and elsewhere. And, uh, and it would be really great to have one in the Mongolian desert too. Now what, what can we do at these stations? We can take a group of people and task them to conduct a sustained, sustained program of field exploration in geology, in microbiology, in paleontology. Okay, the same things they would be doing on Mars and doing them under as many Mars mission constraints as we can impose on them. And by so doing, we learn what's going to work on Mars and what isn't. What technologies would be useful to the crew, what forms of organization of the mission are best. You know, we very early on discovered that if you do a mission like this, it has to be led from the front. So we don't even call our mission control mission control anymore. We call it mission support. Because a Mars mission is going to be needed to be led from the front and the crew is going to have to be trained that way. And this is something we've discovered by doing these missions. We can try to see how much water people need. I don't mean how much water they need to drink. That's a, a number you can get out of a medical textbook. But how much you need to use for washing and cooking, etc. If you really tighten things up, okay, and but now you, you can tighten it incredibly if you want, but you will impact morale. So what is the right trade for the amount of water a crew is allowed to use to be a hard-working and nevertheless effective crew. Okay, that can only come from experience. What kind of field mobility systems? Do we want to explore Mars in big pressurized rovers like the size of buses you sometimes see in the movies with 
mobile laboratories, or maybe something smaller the size of a sports utility vehicle, or maybe something even smaller like all-terrain vehicles. And I'm a big fan of that. I think that uh, Mars needs to be explored in the saddle, and perhaps this is something that uh, Mongolians can relate to. Um, famous horsemen, well, we're not going to take horses to Mars, but you explore Mars riding on an all-terrain vehicle, you've got something that can handle much rougher terrain than a school bus-sized rover and do a lot more exploration. Um, so there's all sorts of things. It is an operational uh, uh, simulation first and foremost. We can also do technical um, uh, simulations as well, testing out not only different kinds of equipment, say ground penetrating radar, but see if the kind of equipment that has been designed is something that could be handled by people in spacesuits. All right, because it's one thing to you know uh, create a piece of equipment; it's another thing to create a piece of equipment that somebody who's wearing a, a spacesuit or even a uh, a simulated spacesuit can actually use with the heavy, thick gloves and all of this. Um, so to find out what instruments are likely to be useful and, and, and be usable, you need to simulate the mission. You need to practice it. Um, we need to practice how people and robots can work together. Okay, this is a combined operations problem. You know, the military, they have to coordinate tanks and infantry and helicopters and airplanes. Well, on Mars, we're going to have to learn to coordinate pedestrian astronauts, astronauts on wheeled vehicles, robotic rovers, maybe aerial drones or helicopters, satellite imagery, mission support back at Earth. All these things have got to be made to work together. And just like the military, you know, they practice doing maneuvers um, and no competent military would ever not do maneuvers, even though maneuvers are not the same thing as real war. There's no one trying to kill you. They nevertheless learn a great deal from these maneuvers. Okay, and they, they would clearly be incompetent not to do it. Well, we have to do Mars maneuvers, and we can do it in the desert in stations like what Mars VR is hoping to build in uh, Mongolia. And you know, and I, the Mars Society will be happy to co cooperate with this effort in any way we can. So, and, and then there's one more thing: you do these stations, and you see people doing Mars exploration. You see it people can see it, and especially, you know, it gets reported in newspapers and on television, and young people can see it, and they say, gee, if I learn my science, this is what I could be doing, and if you want to increase the number of science graduates, if you increase the intellectual capital of your country, there, there's no better program, and furthermore, if Mongolia builds a station like this, people from all the world's major space agencies will come there to use it. So Mongolia, um, on a, a fairly limited budget, uh, could come to be a significant participant in the world's efforts to send humans to Mars. So I'm with you on this 100%, and uh, I will do anything we can to help. Thanks. A great, great talk, and Mars is really next step progress. And it's very important to prepare before landing on Mars. Yeah, definitely. Preparation is everything when it comes to space exploration. And you know, um, analogs are being built actually all around the world to provide the best type of experience and training for survivability and adaptation all around the world. Therefore, we are going to invite astronaut instructor at European Space Center, Mr. Pierre Emmanuel from Belgium. Bonjour, je m'appelle Pierre Emmanuel Poulis et je suis instructeur à l'Eurospace Center en Belgique, mais également le président de la Mars Society Belgium. Et euh, nous avons euh, conçu à l'Eurospace Center le premier village martien en Europe. C'est une base indoor dans notre grand hall d'entraînement et ce qui permet aux visiteurs, mais également aux enfants, les classes de l'espace qui viennent suivre un entraînement d'astronautes pendant plusieurs jours, et aux stagiaires pendant les vacances, des enfants également ou des jeunes qui viennent également suivre ce même type d'entraînement, ça permet de tout savoir sur la planète Mars. Alors nous avons décidé de composer ce village martien en quatre modules. Quatre modules, quatre thèmes, quatre thèmes différents. Dans chacun de ces modules, eh bien, le visiteur pourra, à l'aide d'écrans tactiles et interactifs, tout savoir sur les différents thèmes. Le premier module et le premier thème, 
est consacré au voyage vers Mars, qui va durer en principe à peu près six mois. Qu'est-ce qu'un équipage va faire dans l'espace pendant six mois le temps d'atteindre la planète rouge Psychologiquement, ça ne va pas être facile du tout, et il va avoir beaucoup de travail, c'est très important, pour qu'il soit occupé pendant ces six mois de voyage. Ça correspond à peu près, évidemment, à une mission comme si on était à bord de la Station Spatiale Internationale. Il va effectuer cet équipage, des tas d'expériences scientifiques, etc., etc. Mais l'important, évidemment, ce sera de partir au bon moment. On aborde dans ce premier module également l'importance de la fenêtre de lancement. Il s'agit d'envoyer un équipage en orbite autour du Soleil, puisqu'il faut rattraper la planète Mars. C'est un vol balistique. On ne peut pas changer de trajectoire en cours de route, et donc on parle de tout cela. L'importance donc du bon moment pour, pour partir vers Mars, puisqu'il n'y a une fenêtre de lancement en fait qu'à peu près tous les deux ans. Dans ce module, nous avons également un écran qui nous donne en direct la distance qui nous sépare de la planète Mars. Pour le moment, la Terre est en train de s'éloigner de Mars, et donc on voit les kilomètres qui défilent, la distance qui augmente en direct entre les deux planètes, euh, la Terre et Mars. Si jamais il y avait une éruption solaire très très importante, l'équipage aura quelques heures pour aller se protéger dans une partie d'un vaisseau spatial blindé. Quel est le meilleur blindage possible Si jamais la salle de contrôle avertit brusquement « Attention, il y a une éruption solaire, vous avez quelques heures pour vous réfugier », eh bien, il faudra choisir, le visiteur choisira quel est le meilleur type de blindage possible pour se protéger. Est-ce de l'eau, du plomb, un mélange des deux On peut le découvrir sur notre écran tactile. Le deuxième module est consacré à l'atterrissage sur Mars. Jusqu'à présent, on n'a encore posé sur Mars qu'un petit robot qui pèse environ une tonne. C'est le maximum euh, de poids au niveau d'un robot actuellement sur Mars. Pour poser ce robot... D'une tonne, il a fallu inventer toute une procédure extrêmement complexe et dangereuse pour poser ce module sans casse à la surface de Mars. Avec un, un, un, un bouclier thermique pour protéger la capsule lors de la rentrée dans l'atmosphère martienne, ouvrir des parachutes, des rétrofusées, stabiliser l'engin et une plateforme qui libère un câble qui descend le petit robot à la surface de Mars. Maintenant, il va falloir poser un équipage sur la planète Mars, c'est-à-dire avec un engin spatial qui pesera plusieurs dizaines de tonnes. Comment va-t-on faire sans casse C'est le défi de l'atterrissage, on l'aborde dans le module numéro 2. Dans le module numéro 3, nous abordons la planète Mars en tant que telle, au niveau de la géologie, au niveau du climat, des raisons pour lesquelles on veut aller rendre visite à la planète Mars, le côté scientifique de la planète Mars. Et enfin... Le quatrième module, lui, euh, aborde le pilotage de robots. Le visiteur aura à sa disposition huit robots qui circulent sur un terrain martien reconstitué. À, depuis ce module, les jeunes, les visiteurs peuvent voir ce paysage, bien entendu, à travers une verrière. Et avec un petit joystick et un écran d'ordinateur, l'enfant peut piloter le robot sur le terrain martien, aller viser un QR code... Et une fois qu'il a visé son QR code, eh bien, il y a une information au niveau géologie qui apparaît sur l'écran d'ordinateur. Et ainsi, 8 robots, 8 types de géologie, 8 types de roches, 8 types de façons d'observer la planète Mars. Et le QR code donne une information aux visiteurs sur ce qu'il a découvert. A ma connaissance, c'est la première fois en Europe que nous avons développé un tel village martien. Bienvenue si cela vous intéresse et je suis très très fier de représenter le projet Mars V ici en Belgique et en Europe. So, it's really important to have extensive preparations when we're going to Mars. And analogs play a big role. Yeah, not only that, they're also being built all around the world today and right now. But when it comes to the Gobi, We're saying it's very Mars-like, and it is, definitely is, temperature, environment. But there are other, many, many aerospace researchers that can be done on the Gobi Desert. Definitely. Such as material science experiments, and more specifically the stratospheric balloon experiment that Dr. Hiroaki Akiyama from Japan does. And he's the first ever international advisor of the Mars V project. 
and he's here with us right now. So let's give our attention to Dr. Akiyama on the potential of the Gobi Desert. Good evening, my Mongolia friends. How do you do? My name is uh, Hiroaki Akiyama. I'm a professor of Japanese universities. Yes, I'm very fine, but uh, recently I'm very sad it is because I can't go to your countries uh, because of COVID. Uh, last few years, uh, every year I went to your countries, I make the, some experiments in, in your countries, and of course I make a lot of parties with my friends, with my Mongolia friends. It's a very happy time to me. Uh, so I hope uh, near, in near future I want to go to your countries and I make, the, uh, I make uh, my experience again. Yeah. And of course, I want to mix a lot of parties with you. Uh, this is my hope. Yes. And today, I want to talk about the, my experiment about the stros stratospheric balloons. Uh, maybe you know stratosphere. Stratosphere is uh, uh, high sky places. Uh, the altitude is about uh, 30 kilometers or 40 kilometers. And uh, the stratosphere uh, our, and our ground is completely separated by the very uh, strong windows uh, named jet streams. Uh, so, uh, usually uh, the materials and uh, some life is, uh, we can't go to the stratosphere uh, because of protected by the uh, jet streams. That meaning is, if we find some materials or some life in uh, stratosphere, maybe uh, it's come from uh, space, not as is ground is. So, uh, the stratosphere is a very good place to find the uh, uh, find the materials and life is from space. It's very interesting things. So uh, the purpose of the uh, the purpose of the our uh, uh, experiment is uh, we ca we want to find the life from the space. And uh, another thing is, uh, stratosphere is a very interesting place. Uh, for example, uh, the temperature is very low, uh, about uh, minus 30 or uh, 50 degrees. And uh, the uh, pressures uh, is very low too. Uh, maybe you know the uh, Earth's surface pressure is about 1 atm. 1 atm is uh, uh, the same things about the uh, 1,000 hectopascals, but uh, in stratosphere, the uh, the pressures is about 10 hectopascals. So, uh, stratosphere is stratosphere has a very low degrees, and very low temperatures, and very low uh, pressures. But uh, it's be, uh, it's the same situations uh, of uh, March and skies. So. Uh, maybe you know the surface of the merchants. Uh, the degree is about minus 30 or minus 50 degrees, and the surface of the merchant pressure, uh, merchant atmospheres, uh, uh, merchant ground uh, pressures is about 10 hectopascals. So, uh, if you make some airplane or drones for uh, uh, for Earth's uh, stratosphere. Maybe this airplane or drone can be flight uh, on the Mars and skies. It's very interesting. Uh, of course, I know uh, your members uh, just now they want to make the uh, simulation site of the Mars and ground, but uh, uh, your country uh, has another another good simulation site uh, of uh, Mars and skies. But of course, uh, stratosphere. Uh, every country has a stratosphere, but if you want to make the experience, experiments of the stratospheric balloons, you need a very wide field, wide flat field. It is because uh, the balloons uh, they can't, uh, they uh, they have to flow uh, uh, by windows. Uh, so usually, a balloon can be swept, uh, uh, swept 
about 200 or 300 kilometers by the windows. So, of course, you know, Japan has a very small country, so if, we, uh, if I try to uh, experiment of the uh, thrust balloons uh, in, in Japan, uh, maybe we, we need the ships, ocean ships. <laughs> it's because uh, the, our balloon is easy to fly to uh, fly, fly to from land to ocean, so uh, the, uh, we, uh, it's very difficult to find the balloons on the oceans. But in your countries, uh, we can easy to find the balloons on the, your, gra uh, uh, your grasses ground, grasses fields. And uh, of course, uh, there are a lot of the nomads, and they make the, the uh, nomads create its uh, web-like pass uh, for every every places. So. Uh, we can easy to uh, find the balloons by using the car. Uh, it's very good places. And uh, so, and uh, maybe uh, in near future, uh, if we want to go to Mars, uh, we, of course, we need the uh, simulation site of the merchant surface. But the, the simulation site of the merchant skies, the uh, is uh, very important, uh, important too. So, I think the Mongolia is a very, very good place to simulate with the merchant ground and the merchant sky. Yeah. So, uh, after the corona, after the COVID, uh, I will go to your country too, and I want to make, uh, I want to continue to uh, my atmospheric balloons experiment with my friend. Maybe you know uh, Mongol Kosen. Mongol Kosen's members, uh, they are specialists of the uh, stratospheric balloons experiment. It, it is because uh, we already uh, experiment uh, with them about uh, 20 times, or over 20 times. So uh, they are the specialists of the spe uh, stratospheric balloons. Okay? So see you soon. Bye bye. See you soon too, Dr. Akiyama. He is a good friend of ours. And he already visited Mongolia's Gobi several times to conduct his stratospheric balloon experiment. Mm. Speaking of Gobi, our next speaker will talk about Gobi and Mongolian history in the space industry. She will give you a basic understanding of Mars research. And it is my pleasure to invite Professor of Physics and Astronomy at the National University of Mongolia, Dr. Renchigin Tsozmong. Mars and Earth International Digital Conference, Mars V. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is in Salman Nirinchin. I come from Mongolian National University of Mongolia. I belong to a space science laboratory. Today, I am very honored to share with you on topic why Mongolia and all countries should support Mars study. So here I would like to share as astronomy has many branches. So for example, some astronomers so have solar astronomy, some astronomers belong to stellar astronomy. So today we will focus planetary science. So planetary science, it means to study our planets. So since our topic is Mars, we uh, all we made our research using planetary science or Mars study. Uh, astronomy and the around world today is also make uh, discoveries through ground-based telescopes, space-based observatories, robotic probes, and also theoretical uh, calculations and simulations. So we try to use uh, using all these techniques because uh, we have telescopes, we have also uh, space-based observation, because we have also cooperation and collaboration with ISS, ISS International Space Station. This, there is Japanese station from where our satellite released. So we have also such experience with them in a robotic probes. 
So one of biggest activity now is uh, uh, international astronomical union activities. So as you know, astronomical union activities, activity uh, union, this union celebrated a uh, hundred year anniversary last year. So we had lots of activities for this year and also we have Mongolian outreach uh, activities. So I belong to out, uh, Mongolian um, uh, as a Mongolian outreach coordinator to this organization. So I wanted to share some outputs with you. So one of the uh, biggest activity from uh, 400 year uh, uh, anniversary, we made, uh, we named Exoplanet after our uh, Mongolian uh, star. This star name is Mazalai and also planet is Bambrush. So this Mazalai and Bambrush, it, it was named by kids, Mongolian kids. They, uh, uh, they selected this name and they win this lottery or they, they announced uh, uh, for the whole world. So, uh, for the research, so also we also doing some research using uh, rovers data and also remote sensing data, how Mongolian desert to, to be similar to Mars surface. For example, I am here to uh, wanted to share Spirit in Opportunity rovers because uh, our students and also researchers sometimes use it this data. They provide this data for free, downloadable, uh, publicly uh, available. And this uh, also supports uh, for our research. So I also wanted to, uh, to mark uh, perseverance. perseverance. So this, we also expecting uh, lots of data from Perseverance rover because uh, this is a February 11, uh, next year, uh, February 18, so the uh, perseverance will land on Mars. Then uh, humanity as uh, uh, mankind of this world expecting data from the perseverance. So also uh, I saw this launch for this perseverance uh, from uh, space station, how, the, to, how the, it launched, it was uh, amazing experiment for us. It, uh, so we thank to NASA, share it with us online for free. So uh, Perseverance, I wanted to also share Perseverance also uh, will, will uh, land on this place because this place always was interesting for uh, Mongolians because it is 3.5 billion years ago there was life. So now there's such places in Mongolian Gobi, you can see it, you can find it. So right this time, uh, Mars V organization uh, will appears, uh, appeared and they, they contributed lots of activities for research, for education, for public outreach. For research, they will, they organize some, uh, some, uh, some technology related courses. Also, they announce, uh, encourage young people to study science. And also, um, our public outreach, they develop lots of romantic, inspiring activities so that attract people to night sky. So as I mentioned for research, so research topic is for us very important. So I'm here, I will share something, some findings from, uh, from international uh, outputs uh, for the international journals. So they, uh, we, not only we uh, uh, point out that Mongolian, Ma, Mongolian Gobi similar to Mars, but international researchers, they develop, they also find out some results. It means some, there is some scientifically founded result. For example, Mongolian plateau on Earth and Tarsis on, Bals, on Mars. Tarsis, there is place on Tarsis, place on Mars. They, are, uh, uh, they are, have uh, remarkable similarities. So, 
from here also we uh, uh, using data from opportunity, spirit, curiosity, perseverance. So it is also publicly available data they provide. So our researchers now uh, change their mind. They, they would like to apply hydrology, water, groundwater, snow data and compare it, compare it with Mars surface. So uh, through Mars V, our resource, researchers and students can use for their comparison study in Mongolian plateau and Mars study. It is also good opportunity for them to develop research activity. For example, so as I mentioned before, uh, there is similar place, Mongolian plateau and Tarsis on Mars. There are similarity because uh, in this uh, scientific research, I believe I mentioned this, in this scientific paper, they prove, they uh, made analysis, uh, exactly comparative studies of the Mongolian plateau and Tarsis uh, provide excellent opportunities for understanding surface manifestations, uh, some groundwater uh, process. So it also uh, tells us uh, the Mongolian Gobi will be more and more uh, similarities uh, with Mars studies. So our researchers reading this and using this result, we have now very good uh, mission or some, some goals, some objectives to expand this research. So uh, for uh, similar, uh, sim from rover data, from different rovers data, we can also uh, compare, we can make some uh, comparison using astrogeology and also a project also allow us to experience conduct for Mars and also using some climate change we also with compare with Mars surface data. So Mars we also uh, will develop also uh, develop support uh, citizen science and outreach activity which are on ongoing on now. So now Mars we will change it in different positive ways, I think. The future Mars mission Mongolian Desert Gobi will be developed. So it main, the main goal, it, it will be inspire teenagers to choose career in science technology. So Mars will allow us, it's exciting gateway into astrophysics, astrochemistry, astrobiology, astromathematics, and also astroelectronics, optics, information technology. So Mars, we might contribute, and also I, I, I believe that Mars contribution to be science teachers through Mars uh, findings, and also young generation kids in Mongolia have been showing increase in space science. I know this Mars, we, they uh, attract many young people now. So I believe that astro tourism and astro archaeology, astro culture will be developed in, in the near future. Research, education and outreach and international collaborations also will be together in the very soon. And also Mars for humanity, for mankind goal is, was there ever ancient life on Mars? So to answer that question, Mongolian Gobi will provide research and experimental environment. For example, we provide soil sample and also experiment varieties, sophisticated instrument for future mission. So Mars mission uh, changing every year and developing and expanding. So one of mission will be, I'm sure, in Mongolian Gobi. And also Mars we combine science technology with inspiration and excitement. So, and also it will be unique role and education and capacity building and sustainable development for Mongolia. Thank you for your attention. My name is Rick Davis. 
and I'm the Assistant Director for Science and Exploration in the Mars Exploration Program at NASA Headquarters. I want to thank the Mars V team for this opportunity to say a few words about Martian exploration, as well as why we are so thrilled to be working with Mongolia on Martian exploration. First of all, before I get started, I do want to say that we hope, sincerely hope, that everyone there is as safe as possible with this virus situation. It's pretty bad here, but we're getting through it and across the planet working together. I think we will figure out all that out. I am also the Secretariat for the International Mars Exploration Working Group, which Mars V just recently joined, bringing us to 25 space agencies that are actually now working together to make Martian exploration possible. We have been going to Mars for 50 years, which is incredible to think about, but we have been. And as we look now, we realize we are really ready for the next step, which is the human exploration of Mars. And that is totally cool. But to do that, where you're sending crews out on three year long missions, eight, six to nine months to get there, 500 days either in orbit or on the surface, and another six to nine months back. That is a major undertaking, given how far the planets are from each other. And we are going to need ideas from all over this planet, figure out how to do that and how to do it efficiently and safely. And I would say if there is a common theme amongst all the members of the International Mars Exploration Working Group, it's not only that Mars and exploring it is totally cool, but that we working together can solve these kinds of challenges. And in a way that will really bring a lot of amazing things back to our planet. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about Mongolia and some of the ways I think it could help contribute to Martian exploration. First of all, Mars V has been working very hard on analog, on the possibility of analogs in the Gobi Desert. The Gobi Desert is a pretty fascinating place. The geology is very similar to many places on Mars. It's arid, it's dry, it's remote. And it just has, it even has craters and Mars has lots of craters that have impacted its overall development over time. So there's just some really incredible opportunities in terms of understanding the analogs as they apply to robotics, but also to humans. And to that regard, I'd like to talk a little bit about the ro the human piece because uh, building habitats that work in these environments um, is really a key part of analog work. Uh, understanding isolation is really important. And I would suspect, I have not been to Mongolia yet, and I hope I get to at some point, but I bet that in the Mongolian desert region, it is pretty, it is so sparsely uh, populated that I bet there are a lot of ideas there on how you handle isolation that we have not even thought about working on the International Space Station. And it would be really great not only to use that, that the analog sites to enable Martian exploration, but also to understand that vast experience that probably uh, exists with the people who live in those kinds of sparsely inhabited regions. There is another area that I think Mongolia uh, may end up looking at, and I would hope so, which is what we call small missions. It's actually a really new and emerging capability that allows smaller missions to essentially uh, ride along with larger missions at very low cost. And then they can get out to Mars and don't have to pay the cost for, for all the transportation out there. But then they can do incredible science. We also believe and foresee having uh, a more robust communications infrastructure at Mars, much like at Earth where you have geosynchronous satellites. And if we can achieve that, and we're working very hard to do that, then the capability of these smaller missions to do amazing science and reconnaissance at our second planet is going to be incredible. And it is a great way for new space and, and, uh, countries to actually meaningfully and contribute to the uh, exploration of Mars and the eventual human exploration of Mars. So those are some of the areas that I've, I'm aware of already. And I'm sure that the Mars V team, with, which is as creative as you, they come, will come up with even more ideas 
And we, again, really look forward to working with the, uh, your all's team. Thank you again for this opportunity to say a few words. Um, take care and be safe, all the best. I think this is a really innovative project. I'm really uh, happy to see it be so complementary to uh, a lot of the work and a lot of the efforts that are going on in both Mars science and Mars exploration. I think the team has made a really good case for why the Gobi Desert is analogous to Mars in a number of really important ways, both for research and exploration. And I wish the team and the effort all success. Mars and Earth International Digital Conference, Mars V. Amazing speech and presentations. And I didn't know there was a planet named it Mazala and Van Rouge, and that was amazing. So now, panel discussion of first part of our Mars on Earth International Conference is ready to start. Joining the panel is the establishment team leader and CEO of Mongolian Green Finance Corporation and Mars V Team's honorary advisor, Mr. Boldo Magvan, and the senior lawyer at Dacheng Dentos International Law Firm and Satellite CD Projects Director at Mars V Project, Mr. Buttergill Turbold. It is my privilege to invite these distinguished guests onto the stage. So, uh, Mr. Boldo, you have uh, extensive experience in uh, planning and implementing a multi-stakeholder international projects in public and private sectors, in promoting and enforcing good governance and management uh, practices. And a lot of our audience probably know you best as the former CEO of Khasbank and currently as the president of uh, PMI Mongolia chapter. My uh, question to you is, what would be the best practice or a proven approach to start off on the right foot and implement a uh, mega project like Mars View. Thank you. So any project, uh, small or large, has very simple characteristics. Mm -hmm. It should have very clear objective, scope of work, timeline, and budget, of course, to right. implement the project. So plus to that, recently, the leadership skill Mm -hmm. of uh, members of the project team, mm -hmm. soft skills, human relationship, and agility of the team members to execute any task is acute, if of acute importance. Mm -hmm. So these ingredients will shape the success of any project. And exactly this process was followed by previous space ex exploration projects by our northern neighbor Soviet Union right. to bring Yuri Gagarin to space mm -hmm. and US Apollo mission to land uh, man in on, Mar on the moon. On the moon, moon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not yet, on yeah, Mars. So those projects were uh, more like a technological and of course geopolitical uh, projects mm -hmm. at that time. Uh, these days, uh, I think it's no difference. Uh, any project, including Mars V, mm -hmm. uh, should follow this project execution processes. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, my next question to you is, what would be our primary focus and uh, concern when uh, creating a brand new project for the space industry? In Mongolia. Mm -hmm. So Mars V is the great initiative from civil society, from Mongolian youth mm -hmm. to be part of the global, global mission uh, land on Mars. Mm -hmm. Mongolian youth wants to be part of this global process. Because of that a grand mission we should understand where we're going, where we're entering, mm -hmm. because this uh, multinational project has a multi-sectoral, mm -hmm. multi-sectoral uh, 
feature, which means many sectors, different sectors have to participate mm -hmm. to successfully implement this mission. Geology, construction, science, agriculture. Right. You can name. Then it, this project uh, has another feature. It uh, involves many uh, different disciplines, mm -hmm. professions. Mm -hmm. Astronauts, right. uh, land experts, mm -hmm. biology, microbiology, mm -hmm. IT, chemistry, everything. So then this project also involves different actors, mm -hmm. like civil society, non-governmental organizations who are committed to contribute to this mission, plus private sector, private sector and state, public sector. Right. So from here you can see it's a huge grant initiative involving uh, many, many uh, stakeholders, participants. You have to be able to coordinate mm -hmm. or be part of this big process. So that's the thing I would like to emphasize when Mars V team mm -hmm. is committed to contribute on their own way to this global project. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. And uh, the last question uh, in the and our uh, panel discussion goes to both of our panelists. And uh, it is, uh, what is the importance of Mongolia's contribution to Mars and space exploration? What is our value proposition? And last but not least, how can we all benefit from this? Yeah, first of all, um, this Mars V project in Mongolia, mm -hmm. uh, initiated by Mongolian youth, uh, highly committed to contribute to the global mission. So it's, pro it's an initiative which comes from uh, bottom mm -hmm. to up. That's why it's so important. There is a huge desire and contribute to this mission. So that's the first value I think Mars V project can bring into the global mission. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, our natural value uh, could be the unique environment, geological and envir uh, ge geological environment, Gobi Desert, mm -hmm. which is believed to be much closer to Mars environment than any other part in, in on Earth. Right, and then extreme climate in Mongolia, mm -hmm. below and above zero, 80 or 90 degrees difference. Right. Extreme climate can be a, exper an experimental mm -hmm. platform for research and study in order to reach Mars. And that is the value Mongolia can contribute to this uh, and our and I think another value we can Mongolians can bring into this global mission is that agility of Mongolian people mm -hmm. uh, nomadic in nature mm -hmm. Mongolian people are extremely adaptable and right. agile mm -hmm. flexible and fast fast decision makers in extreme environment, as we described in Gobi Desert, when there is almost no vegetation, mm -hmm. uh, no water, how nomadic people manage to survive, not only to survive, uh, but prosper, uh, taking care of livestock and prospering. So I think right. that's, that's the skill. Agile skill could be useful mm -hmm. for the astronauts 
Right. Astronauts. And the mission to Mars. Yeah. Who are going to mm -hmm. Mars. Right. So that's the value we can bring to this mission. That's great. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have you here. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <laughs> Uh, my first question is for you, Mr. Batargul. Uh, Mongolia is now striving to find its place in the space industry among many developed and uh, developed nations in the world. Uh, our main goal is to encourage cooperation between nations, but there are of course dozens of all other Mars and log sites in the world. Um, in your opinion, what are the competitive advantages of Mongolia in the space industry? Of course, right now, our nation doesn't have any high-tech space technology to compete. Mm -hmm. However, we have our own contributive ways to participate. That mm -hmm. is our nature, the uh, landscape, geophysics, uh, as well as Mongolia's uh, uh, long-standing uh, position of a neutral, politically neutral right. uh, country for everyone. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we don't have like uh, enemies, mm -hmm. we don't have any terrorist attacks or any turmoils. Uh, we are a very peaceful, calm country mm -hmm. to host this uh, magnificent project and uh, it's a safe place for all par participating bodies to place here. And we're not antagonizing with any uh, countries in the mm -hmm. world. So we are open to everyone to come here. The aim of this project is not to deplete the Earth and move to right. Mars. Uh, the idea is to love and protect our Earth mm -hmm. uh, through the prism of exploring Mars. So M Mongolia in these terms is uh, very suitable. Um, and there are many aspects of a uh, very low density of population. There are uh, places in Mongolia and Gobi where n no living creatures mm -hmm. around, not mentioning people. Right. So there are no uh, flying routes for aircrafts. Mm -hmm. uh, so Mongolia has a very uh, advantageous position to support the satellite mm -hmm. uh, maintenance and uh, supervision. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Mongolia is uh, uh, extended from uh, west to east, so uh, most of the satellites are uh, orbits are th that way, right? right? So it's very uh, advantageous position to uh, observe the uh, mm -hmm. skies. One of the main projects of Mars is to develop a technological free zone. Uh, this is mainly a geopolitical issue. Uh, as a senior lawyer at an international law firm, you must have some uh, insight in that area. Uh, what is the importance of Mongolia participating in uh, establishing a space technology free zone in the Gobi? And uh, what could be the spillover effects into society and the country on the broader level? It is a very ambitious project, not only mm -hmm. for this uh, nation, but uh, for the entire humankind. Mm -hmm. So. There are many ways uh, it's going to affect us, uh, and it's uh, reciprocal. Mm -hmm. uh, Mongolia is going to benefit no, not only in the regional wise, but nation wise. Uh, we are going to uh, shift from our brown economy towards the green economy, knowledge based economy, as well as uh, strategic wise, uh, it is a possibility for us to turn our uh, shortcomings into an uh, advantage. For example, uh, uh, usually it is a hindrance uh, for novelties to enter, uh, say, the previous kind of generation of uh, technology right. uh, needs to be replaced, but uh, it, uh, return on investment not there mm -hmm. yet. So it becomes an economical uh, obstacle to introduce new technology. Uh -huh. So in Mongolia, we don't have this technology at all, So, mm -hmm. which is like a greenfield project, and we can uh, introduce the latest technology from the ground zero. Right. So this is an ad advantage of this. Mm -hmm. So it is a strategy, uh, like uh, how to make a lemonade out of a lemon. And uh, on Mars, the situation is very similar to Mongolia. 
uh, the extreme temperatures, dust storms, and it's a great opportunity to test it in Mongolia mm -hmm. before we uh, try it uh, somewhere on Mars, right? right? So, on the other hand, it's also a great opportunity to uh, test, uh, uh, let's say, uh, Mars constitution in Mongolia. Mm -hmm. Because we're going to send these men and women to Mars who are risking their lives for humankind. Mm -hmm. And we shall not jeopardize their lives and their efforts Definitely. Uh, for, say, some national or local conflicts. They shouldn't right. affect those who are on the way to Mars. Mm -hmm. right? So Mongolia is a great uh, playground scientifically and also like just for a humankind. Mm -hmm. to test those uh, legal, uh, how to say, real legal uh, situation uh, to model it in Mongolia before mm -hmm. we send someone to Mars. With reaching Mars right around the corner, a large number of aspiring youth have dedicated their lives to Mars exploration for the potential to go there in the future. Mm -hmm. And I'm so excited to invite Elisa Carson. Are you ready to meet Elisa Carson? I hope you are. And she is the first person to land on Mars. So let's check it out. Mars and Earth International Digital Conference. Mars V. Hi, my name is Alyssa Carson, and ever since I was a little girl, I have always been interested in wanting to become an astronaut and the idea of traveling to Mars one day. Looking back, I don't remember everything in my childhood, but um, the best guess I can really come up with, and same for my dad, the best thing that he can kind of come up with is that it might have been an episode of The Backyard Again, which is this little cartoon I used to watch all the time on Nickelodeon, and basically they had a Mission to Mars episode. And I even had the poster for that episode, Mission to Mars, hung up in my bedroom, and it's really the only place we can think of as to where I would have heard the word Mars or space or anything like that. So that's kind of where my passion for space began, really just starting to ask questions about space and Mars. And I've developed a love for space and passion for it and wanting to pursue some sort of career in it ever since. So I really started out by just asking for any information I could get about space, whether that was going to the library and looking for books or videos or posters, anything like that. I eventually got the opportunity to go to Space Camp in Huntsville, Alabama, which was really amazing. And there it was just where I kind of flourished in learning all this information about space, um, history of space, the future of space, building my own model rocket, playing astronaut, all these really fun things. But that really helps me explore what I would actually want to do in space and what was actually going on in the space industry and what opportunities were there. So kind of growing up, I continued to go to different camps along the way, um, Space Camp in Izmir, Turkey, Space Camp in Laval, Canada, Virginia. Space Flight Academy, just all sorts of different things to kind of learn as much as I could about what was going on in the space industry and what opportunities there were to kind of help me figure out what I wanted to do. Um, from then on, I eventually joined Project POSSUM, which is a citizen science research organization. So POSSUM actually stands for Polar Suborbital Science in the Upper Mesosphere, which basically just means that we do science, um, especially dealing in the atmosphere, but we do all sorts of other science as well. Um, so for example, with Project POSSUM, I've been able to do some really amazing research opportunities such as microgravity flights, water survival training, g-force training, decompression, spacesuit evaluations. We work a lot with Final Frontier spacesuit design which has been really awesome. So that's been a really amazing opportunity I've been able to have doing real-life research while in high school and now in college. So currently I am a sophomore in college studying astrobiology at Florida Tech in hopes to be an astrobiologist and then in turn applying that into space. So ever since I was little I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, kind of landed on astrobiology and then since then I've been building a resume and building up those skills to eventually apply to the astronaut selection process. So that's kind of my goal and kind of how I've gotten to this point. And so a little bit about what's actually going on right now in the space industry and kind of the hopes for the future. So looking right now, the plans or the current plans really are to go back to the moon sometime in the 2020s and then on to Mars in the 2030s. So that is kind of the time frame that we're hoping for. Um, there's a brand new rocket, the 
SLS Space Launch System and Orion Capsule. Both of those are going to be new to the space industry um, once they are fully built and prepared and ready for humans to take flight. Um, and those are going to be the components that are going to get us to Mars for the first time. So that's all really exciting. There's a whole lot of science to be done in terms of Mars and also going back to the moon. Um, going back to the moon is really going to be a lot of just testing and learning about the new rocket, how it works. Is it safe for people? Is it um, capable of even bringing us to the moon? If it can't get us to the moon, then it most likely can't bring us to Mars. So that's really going to be the whole point of the Artemis program, which we will start seeing more development in the next coming years. Um, but really the grand scheme of things for a mission to Mars is that we would have um, this brand new rocket bring us to Mars, which should take around six months or so. And then once the astronauts are actually on Mars, they'll spend around a year there doing all sorts of science, research, um, all of the typical things you would picture an astronaut doing uh, on the red planet. But at the same time, they'll also be doing a lot of housekeeping, whether that's changing air filters or um, maintaining some sort of garden to have a better food supply and those sorts of things. And that's really going to be what the astronauts are doing while they are on Mars, hopefully learning lots of amazing things. The goal with Mars is that we have so many crazy ideas of colonizing Mars, terraforming Mars, yet we really need a better understanding of how realistic those goals are and what we can actually do with them. Eventually the astronauts will come back, six, month, uh, six to nine month journey back, and then that will be the end of that mission. So a lot of exciting things to look forward to in the space industry as well as the idea of commercial space coming into play. You know SpaceX has now sent astronauts to space which has been really exciting. Um, but it's going to be really interesting to see all of that develop, whether SpaceX continues to send um, astronauts to the International Space Station, whether SpaceX has, has ideas of going to Mars, um, Virgin Galactic with space tourism. It's going to be a whole lot of space coming up in the next few years. So that should be something really excited, uh, especially for those who are interested in pursuing some sort of space career. So the good thing um, to hear really is that there is going to be a whole lot of opportunities within the space industry. Um, I definitely think that with going back to the moon coming up soon, eventually going to Mars coming soon, as well as SpaceX, Virgin, Blue Origin, not to mention all the other companies, and globally as well, how active we are being in space right now. So I truly believe that we're going to be getting to a point where there's more astronauts, more jobs in space, more talk of space, so that's all really exciting. So if you are someone who is interested in pursuing some sort of space career, I can give you some advice in that, or honestly, it definitely can relate towards any dream whatsoever or any career career here on earth as well. But I want to give some a few tips that I've learned through my experiences um, and hopefully share it with you guys. So definitely the first step is really just deciding what you want your dream to be. There are so many different choices of what we can actually do with our lives and so a lot of times that can be super intimidating but it's all about what you're passionate about. I definitely think that it's totally worth being obsessed with whatever you're going into and enjoying what you do. So I do think that we all have a passion for something or or an interest for something that we can pursue and you can kind of look back at school you know what are you more interested in what subjects are you interested in because something like math can be a math teacher versus an engineer which are two very different things but both involve math so you can kind of adventure to all sorts of different careers especially looking within the space industry there's a lot of careers that we don't typically think of but are definitely there you definitely do not have to study some sort of science or STEM major to actually be involved with space. There's a whole lot of psychology involved, journalism, um, and so much more other majors that you can actually apply to space. There's someone who has to prepare all the food that goes up to the astronauts. There's someone who has to study the food psychology and what astronauts eat and uh, what they eat and when they eat it and how that affects them. So there's a whole lot of opportunities that you guys can look into to actually start finding what you're interested in. So look to kind of connect you know if you're interested in food but also interested in space figure out ways to connect those to do something that you're really going to love the second bit of advice I can really give you is really to be vocal about what your dreams are. It's so important to tell people what you're interested in doing because you never know where those opportunities are going to come from. So let's say, for example, you're interested in robotics and eventually want to pursue space robotics. Um, that was something totally awesome. And even when you're young, you can get involved in building your own robot, going to robotics competitions, which is already going to start building your resume and getting you well along into a career in robotics. But while you're at those robotics competitions it's important to tell someone like hey yeah I love building robots and you know in the future I hope to get involved in space robotics and even that little statement or telling someone a 
you know, a little thing that you might be interested in space robotics, you know, they could say, oh, I happen to know someone who knows someone who's interested in space um, and works in the industry or someone who actually does that as a job. So you really never know where those opportunities are going to come from. So I really want to encourage you to be vocal about your dreams and tell everyone what you want to do. I know that when I was younger saying I want to be an astronaut and go to Mars, it sounded like the absolute most crazy thing, but I promise it's becoming more and more of a reality the more I've worked towards it. So don't be afraid to tell people what you want to do um, because it is, if it is something that you're passionate about, then you can definitely make it a reality. Now the third topic that I really want to touch on here is the importance of having some sort of support system or some sort of person in your life that is there to tell you that you can keep going and tell you that you can get to where you want to be. For me it was really my dad because when I was younger saying that I wanted to be an astronaut and go to Mars he was super encouraging of just telling me yes you can do whatever you want to do and he didn't really have um, anything else to say but support me and go to camps with me, travel with me and all of that so that's been really amazing to have just a constant support so looking at your own life whether that is a parent or a friend or a teacher it really can be anyone but just having someone to kind of be by your side or every now and then just tell you yeah you got this or have some sort of support can make a huge difference there's so many different things that we do that has been um, that we really need support to kind of help us along even in a lot of the different trainings or research that I've done it's always been amazing to have either like a team member or someone just encouraging you along the way. So I'd really urge you to find someone or someone in your life to really support you in what you're doing to help you follow your dreams. But also remember that it's important that you possibly could be that person for someone else. So continue to look for that person to help support you in your dreams or if you've already found them, really keep keep them close because it, it makes a huge difference when you're going after your dreams. But I definitely believe that we can all accomplish our own dreams in our own way. We have so many big ideas and big dreams that we want to accomplish. For example, like the mission to Mars is a very large dream, but we do it with thousands and thousands of people all around the country contributing to make that a reality. And they're even working today, even though that the mission is several years away. So there's a whole lot of hard work that goes into achieving dreams. And whether that is pursuing a career or or taking up a new position at your job that you already have, or starting a new project, um, a new goal, whatever it may be, all these things can kind of contribute to that and really make it feel more realistic and something that you can do. Just remember that if you're passionate about it, um, if it's something that you really want to do, you can achieve it. So really follow your dreams. Never let anyone take your dreams away from you. Um, and yeah, really just stick with it because you never know where those opportunities or where you might lead to. So yeah, I just really want to encourage you to stick with every, whatever your dreams are. Um, I think that the worst is to look back and regret on it. So even though it may sound crazy, absolutely go for it. And yeah, continue to hopefully support the space industry. It is really amazing to to see space becoming slightly more trendy recently. So that's been really amazing to see. So I really love seeing public support because I truly believe that we can't do anything in the space industry without that. So continue to follow your own dreams, support space, and I hope to see you guys either working in the space industry or achieving whatever your dreams may be. Hmm. That was great talk. By the way, how long has Elisa been in astronaut training? I believe she has been in astronaut training since she was 13. Mm, so proud of her. Yeah, me too. I believe there are lots of boys and girls today watching us who dream of becoming an astronaut one day. And I'm really interested to know how the astronaut training, the astronaut selection processes go. Me too. And to answer exactly that question, we are going to invite an astronaut trainee who works with the European Space Agency, Camille Fournier, joining us from France. Bienvenue. And I am very happy to be able to talk to you, despite the current sanitary condition. So a little bit about me, I'm 19 years old and I am a student in physics at the University of Savoy in France. I am planning to do a master and then a PhD in astrophysics, specialized in cosmology. In addition, I'm pursuing a training to become an astronaut and to realize my dream of setting foot on Mars. And today, I'm going to talk briefly about the training that aspiring astronauts takes to play to prepare for Mars. 
So, at these conferences, you must already realize that the Red Planets make people around the world dream. This increased interest in Mars is leading to the formation of a new generation of enthusiasts, and we call it the Mars Generation. I am a part of this generation that sees in Mars immense possibilities for humanity and preparing for the future of space exploration. Among these people, we find the aspirant astronauts. However, the selection to become an astronaut are really tough and reputed to be the most complicated. In fact, 10,000 to 20,000 people apply in each NASA recruitment campaign. And at the end of the selection process, less than 0.1% of candidates are selected by NASA to begin astronaut training. And it is also a similar case for the European Space Agency, ESA, JAXA, and other space agencies around the world. So, to understand our training, I will tell you first a little bit about the training that astronauts and astronaut candidates during recruitment selections follow. So, to begin, in short, to be an astronaut, you need to have a good view 10 on 10 have a good psychology and way of thinking, be attentive and able to concentrate in any situation without ever being overwhelmed by emotions, possess a very solid academic record, have the appropriate age, have a minimum of a master's degrees in science or 1,000 hours of piloting experiences. And to verify it's conditioned there. At the time of the selection by the space agencies, the candidates are subjected to various tests. Psychological test, logical test, physical test, and I forgot some for sure because the selection can last up for one year. So this is the dream job to which I aspire as well as all the aspirants. But we have therefore adapted to face this wall in order to maximize our chances. So I would like to make it clear that we are outside of any organization that trains us in all areas for the selection. Given that, each case of aspiring astronaut is different because we do not have all the same means. So I will tell you about my experiences and the different trainings I'm pursuing. So, for my part, I started to prepare for the selection in 2016 by doing some psychological tests that I found in books. And afterwards, I learned a lot about the different selection tests and I adapted my training according to them. So, an astronaut must be comfortable scuba diving because most of NASA's training is done in a specialized pool. So. I started by taking an advanced diving courses and I got my diploma for diving at a depth of 20 meters. In addition, an astronaut can be chosen by his skills in piloting an airplane. I am therefore training to obtain my private pilot license. ESA has a program called CAVES, which takes place in a cave for two weeks where astronauts have to get used to being alone in a cramped place. So I'm therefore pursuing caving courses in different caves in France. Skydiving and survival in extreme conditions are also proposed trainings and they are next on my list of things to do. There is also learning foreign languages because it's also a part of the process. So I speak French fluently and I'm learning English, Spanish, Russian and I hope that I could learn a lot of other languages but it's really complicated to learn everything. And also there are infrastructure called Space Camp which gives a good estimate of the astronaut job during training courses etc. There are some around the world, and for my part, I had the opportunity to train in one of them, the Aerospace Center in Belgium. And this center represents a good training for, for the future of our job. 
but I'm not the only one who does this training. Hundreds of people from all over the world are actually preparing for Mars. And we are fortunate that plans for Mars revolve around colonization and not just exploration. Because colonization will allow us to bring more people to the planet and thus allow greater accessibility to the profession of our dream. So, we are aspiring astronauts who all give their all to make their dream come true by carrying out a whole range of training and education to obtain qualification essential to the astronaut profession. You can therefore see that the future is there in the end of a world generation, ready to make all the sacrifices for the evolution of, a, of the human species and its knowledges. I would like to say a big thank you for Mars V, who helped me with my dream and actually helped me with this conferences and next my training in Gobi Desert and soon in Mongolia. Thank you so much everyone for following what I had to tell you and I leave you with the rest. See you on Mars. You know, it's absolutely inspiring to see the amount of work and dedication put in by the Mars generation to their preparations for future Mars missions. It's astonishing. And that dedication is shown by our next speaker, Linda Raimondo. As part of her astronaut training, she spent prolonged period of time in a cave just like what Camille is trying to do. Just imagine yourself living in a cave in that closed space. I can't, so let's check it out. All right. Hi, everyone. Before starting, I really want to thank you all for having me today. It's a very big pleasure to me being here and being part of the Mars 5 project. Unfortunately, we still cannot meet in person, but we all know what the global circumstances are and we know that it's better staying away today for staying much closer tomorrow when this global pandemic will hopefully be gone. For starters, I want to briefly introduce myself. My name is Linda Raimondo, I'm 21 years old and I'm from Italy. I would say that I have two different lives. In the first one, I'm a student and I'm studying my Bachelor in Physics. My plan for the near future is the one to go abroad for my master and my PhD studies. I want to study in different nations because I think that nowadays it's important being as international as possible. And then because I love challenges and I want to see how far I can push myself with my own strengths. On the other side, my second life is the one more, more public, the one in which I'm a science communicator and a public speaker. My greatest goal for the future is the one to become an astronaut. And I think that my two lives put together can help me um, reach it some, some way, in some way. But now let's stop talking about myself and let's talk about the reason why I am here today. Let's talk about space, about its exploration and about its importance in our everyday life. We all know that space exploration is probably the, the greatest challenge for of humanity. Space is an unfriendly, harmful and dangerous place. But nevertheless, we still want to go there. We still want to explore it. We still want to push ourselves farther and farther. The question might be why? Well, uh, my, my personal answer to, to the question is that it's in our nature of human being, beings having the, the will to explore new, new places, to discover new worlds, to overcome our own limits. Also, the great Tsiolkovsky, who was one of the father of modern astronautics, used to say, the Earth is the cradle of humanity, but mankind cannot stay in the cradle forever. And honestly, I couldn't agree more with him. We are human beings and we are made for challenging ourselves. So that's the reason why we still want to go to space. 
But then there is also another reason that probably is even more important than, than the first one. And the second reason is that the outer space might represent our future home in the next years. We live in a century in which our mother spaceship Earth is overexploited. And we need to find a solution to, do, to that overexploitation as soon as possible. And maybe that solution lies exactly in space. Moon, Mars, the near planets and also asteroids may, might represent a precious mine for the, the old humanity. In the last 50 years we did incredible things and we achieved great progresses in space exploration. We went to the moon, we reached other planets thanks to different probes and rovers. And we also landed on an asteroid. And today we are living at the beginning of a new golden era for the space exploration. An era in which space will not be too far from us anymore. An era in which we, as humankind, all together, will send the first human being to Mars and maybe farther. And honestly, I'm incredibly excited while saying those things because I want to be an active part of this change. I want to be an active part of this challenge. Sending humans to another, pla to another planet so far from our Earth, like Mars, like Mars, will be the greatest challenge ever, not only in terms of technological development, but also in terms of human factors. The main reason why I am so in love with all those stuff concerning astronautics is that I truly think that space exploration is not only about space, but it is also and probably mostly about the human nature. Going to space means study in the deepest way possible our nature in terms of physiology and psychology. The hardest problem for an engineer is not about the, technolo the, the technology needed for, to reach the stars, for reaching the stars. It's not about the broken piece of a probe. The greatest problem for an engineer is about the human psychology, a factor that none an engineer nor anybody else can control. Astronauts have to work in nightly unusual environments where they must withstand multiple, multiple stressors. Of course, they are well prepared and in their background they have thousands of hours of training. But here on Earth it is impossible to reproduce an environment which is 100% equal to the one in space. And when, they, the, when the astronauts get to space, they will always have to face with some unexpected events. Human psychology is probably the most complex and mysterious thing on Earth. We cannot predict in any way how it can react during, during dangerous events. And even if astronauts are super, super well trained, they will always remain human beings. So, sending humans to Mars means that those persons will have to live for many months in a closed environment, with always the same mates who are also part of the crew. And if they become homesick or heartsick in that case, they cannot just look out of the window and see a blue sky or a red sunset. They cannot go out and breathe deeply. They are obliged to remain in that closed space without the chance to go back home. And we don't know how a human mind can react in such a stressful and hard environment. In all those years, many studies have been conducted and many, many others are in work in progress here on Earth and on board the space station. In this, in this framework, analog missions have a fundamental importance for the ongoing, ongoing searches because they represent the only way we have to understand a bit better all those things that we still don't know precisely. 
those analog missions allow us to prepare, to prepare the future astronauts in the best way we can and will have a central role for the next crews of astronauts going to Mars. And it's for this exact reason that I am really, really, really excited about the Mars 5 project in the Gobi Desert. I think that it will represent an important milestone for the next generations of astronauts. And honestly, I couldn't be more happy, more proud and happier of being part, for being part of this team. So thank you again. Yo, astronaut training does seem like a lot to take in at first glance. Now, Linda actually speaks five languages and she's a public speaker. These girls are so incredible, they will definitely be the f face of future Mars exploration. I can't argue with that. So, this is marking the end of the second part of the conference. So, you know what? Let's head back down to the stage. Let's do it. Mars and Earth International Digital Conference. Mars V. Тэгэхээр яг энэ өлөг гүрүүлийн судалгаа ялан өлөг гүрүүлийн олдвар цуглуулгаараа Монголын гол бол үнэхээр дэлхийд хаврахан газар. Ер нь бол одоо хэдэн жилийн өмнө бол дэлхийд дээр өлөг гүрүүлийн олдвар олддог 3хан том цэг байна гэж үздэг байсан. Олноороо олддог. Тэнээс биш одоо хагас дутуу олдвар бол хаанаас ч олдож байна л да. Төвний нэг нь болоо явхрах бол Монголын гол буюу Монголын одоо нэмэгдлийн өвөрт байдаг тэр бүлэг олдвар газар л хэлдэг байсан. Тэгээ яхарх we also do this. We also do this. We also do this. We also do this. We also do this. We also do this. We also do this. We also do this. We also do this. We also Тэгэд их олон ямар аа бол яг л одоо манай тэр нэмэгт гэдэг юм уу далтан цаадах хувьд байдаг эртний хурд сэлэрсэн тийм газруудтай их төстэй харагдаж байсан. Тэгэхээр бол яг аргагүй одоо хэрвээ тэр Марстай холбоотой их дэлхий дээр одоо ямар ба нэгэн тийм одоо судалгаа жилгээ хийхэд бол их дэлхий дээр одоо дасга зургууд хийдэг ч одоо зүгээр санасан хэсэгч байгаа хүн ч гэсэн одоо хийсэр ирсэн. Тэгэхээр тэрнтэй адилхан нэрвээ тиймэрхүү одоо сургуулилт хийх юм уу эсвэл одоо заавал одоо хүн болгон дээр марстер очиж үз болцсон уусан уу штэ тийм учраас тэрийг одоо төлөөлөх тийм газар нутаг бол яахгүй одоо манай одоо тэр биднийн олдвар зөвлөлөг олдог тэр олдвар газрууд маань их төстэй санагдаж байгаа юм л да тэгэхээр ийм ажлыг ер нь хийх хэрэгтэй байхал гэж бай бодож байна яг тэгэхээр энэ чинь ер нь бол одоо хүн төрөлхтөн чинь одоо сансрыг эзэмшээ сансар дээр бүр хүнээ нисгсэн бол хэдхэн жил байна штэ таг жаргахын жил юм л тэгтээ а тэгэд нэг хэсэг бол бас нэлээн тийм эрчимтэй явж байгаад одоо ингээд бас жахан тийм сулрч байгаад одоо жахан итгэж байгаа шиг байна. Ер нь бол болцоотой орнууд бол ул ер нь одоо сайхан уртал одоо манай урд төрш хүртэл одоо салуу одоо бүр дээж авахаар явдаг шүү дээ. Энд чи дээж авна гэдэг чинь бол бас судалгаа их гэлээ шүү дээ. Тэгэхээр ийм судалгаа бол байх зайшгүй байх хэвээр. Зүгээр ийм болцоо бол манай энэ нутагт маань Монгол нутагт маань байгаа гэдэг бол их чухал байна л да. Тэгэхээр энэ болцоог бол бид ашигласан зүйтэй. А гэхдээ энийг одоо хийхэд бол энэ болоо бас том ажил, том төсөл болно гэж би бодож байна. Та нарын одоо танилцуулгаа сонсов. Тэгэхээр энэ дээр бол бас нэг юм хийхэд нөгөө юм аваас мартаж болохгүй. Ягаад гэвэл одоо палентологч бид нар бол бол тийм олдвар газруудтайгаа бол ерөөсөө а одоо маш тийм одоо нууцлагдмал тийм одоо ховор нандин баримтуудыг хадгалсан тийм сотор бичиг шиг ойлгод юм аа. Тэр чинь яг харахгүй ингээ нарийн ажиллах юм бол тэр эртний үе тохирцсоо чи яг нэг номын хууц шиг ингээ үе тохицсон байдаг. Тэгэхээр тэр үе тохицсон тэр одоо номын хуудсаа бол бид нар одоо бас тийм том ажил хийх хаа зүгээр бас одоо гимтэх тийм ээ эсвэл одоо устгаж өгөө олох хүний хөлөөр сүйт хэлдэх юм зүрэн тийм юм бол маш их анхаарах хэвээр. Тэгэхээр ер нь 
Turun bihessin, yurtdışlı tır hayır orkun kadar ettiğin nedeni tem bayıktı, tevdursun kadar ettiğin gibi mangal açılas, in o tüm da mangal çöp bitmiş, çöpte uğur iş, in o da teskin etti, hundursun diye mon bitmiyor hulles uğur vaxta, inega hatas kısta, hamvas kısta, mangal oz, yürüsü, tır in da başın tazabın çekildiğin, da teskin sotlanı topuza, ina da mangal çöp asar tam orkun otun tıktı açılas. این چیزی نگه کاتر دیر نه مغازه نگه دیگه ولی ولی یه هستر داده مغازه هست ولی تو هر چیزی اینی که ولی مغازه کانسان داره گوشت ولی این چیزی این چیزی نگه دیگه داره ولی مغازه ولی آخه این اتا فشن چیزی که اولی کروی آلت رو تازه ریبود آنگر تا تا بیت لند گیج نریل تو هست مغازه داره گیج ولی مغازه ولی چیزی مغازه یا گفتم ولی این چیزی خورس و آخه یه چیزی هرت سیلی چیزی نگه داره آخه تو هر تیم کاتر دیر بود ولی این چیزی نی نوار هم بازم من Masca çürtül barak tarz ayrı masca mutlaka bu zilud itzu kadar bitti. Tabi iyi mazeret oldu. İzin çözdün ki tek manyol oldu. Yamurvan ne gibi mazeret şey oldu. Ayıl çözdün. Bu tek tohum balıkla. İskola da tabuk ne yer çıkarsak. Ata tema da tüstevetli ne sıkılar. Tema da sansartun ne sıkık tema. Da bilkes rostin kadar balıkla. Тэй тэм хүн майгаар эдзэнтээл болох хэвэхтээн баам. Тэг хэн болуул эдзэнтээ энэ болуул хэдзээч тэгээж хуэл бас маслах хэдээ муу. Энэ зүр энэ тэмэг эвдэй чэм хэлтэг тэм энэ бол байхгүй болон. Дээгээ дээр нь хэрвээ тэн тэн гадзар дээр нь тэм дээ түхчүүл хүгжээ тэр хэн болуул энэ шинжилхуан бол. Эстэн нь мэний мөрөөддэг Archeologin şimdi tuhaf gibi dolu, hun turlu etni, etni tuhaf gibi sotlan şimdi. Çünkü dünyanın zor seyreti onu yaparım çoğun garga çirti gibi olur. Onu kırar çalıp oturtta bide. Ya da kırar, birçok usu usu kırar onu tuhaf gibi yaparım çoğun garga çirti gibi olur. Archeologin şimdi tuhaf boyu, archeologin çiğ uğruk bide. Ya da böyle mangalın archeologin şimdi şimdi tuhaf bal onu onu kırar hamgün çoğul açla hiyde. Ya da kırar mangal çoğun boyu nutlu çiğin ata tuhaf gibi uğruk sotlar bide. Ata bizim sorulur çok tam hava ruhu ete uçuras. Bir de uçun yani sotlun şenjil. Çünkü yani dolgun zor serin ko aram zayıf nuhuk. Ama bu ata kurşun gelte olsa da veya ter sorulur çiğ mide ne dolun kır onun batıtı veya no. İnd bir de uçun yamar ne gibi batılar. Ata dün şenjil gibi analiz edici. Orsu diye tuhuk. Onun zor batıtı var garaj çirik. Hamun çok daha çok tuhut tabi. Ce nutçte onun kır nutçte çiğ ko yerin dilkin hum. Zaten tuhun da standart sensör aktör gibi oluyor. Tıpkı nutun da real herkes için zor. Tehlike takıyor zor mu? Ata istni azmur vazam ulusun bedi. Tıpkı nutçte öyle dost. Nugo yurtun soyu şu tıpkı öyle dost. Aktör gibi yurtun sin tuhaf etti. Zavur ağustun bedi gelde. Bitni ata öyle bir şey var yine. Hatni zor gider o diyan zor yine ata itki ata durste bak maskını duydu. Yani zerim sotlaşçı dostum zerim ata sanır kaççı dostum yine her yer hatta halbuki tehlike verildi. Тэхтэй үнэндээ ол энэ харь гарэг гэхээс эйлүү тэгээр үнэхээр сутлгааны хаад түршинд бэд үхэн энэг бол тухоу үйээ нэгэн үүдлчээд ауг аймгийхнээ өөрсдэйхо дүрсэлсэн нөгөө өртэнцэн тухоу айлголд мэдэй чадахуу байсан зүүлээ шашны одоо юүгээ тэнд гарахсан зүүл болуу гэж бэд үхэн бодудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудуудууду
одоо явган сууж одоо бүх болохгүй гэсэн малгайгаа бууруулж чинь харуулна. Эсвэл нударгаа дотогшин хийж гэдэг юм уу. Энэ бол нөгөө эрсдсийн хүн болж одоо тий одоо нөгөө хүнийг сүнсийг авч явах хүн болж одоо өөрийнхөө дүрийг хоргож хүртэл ирдэг ийм зан үйлүүд одоо тэмдэглэж үлдсэн байдаг. Тэгэхээр энэ болгон угсаатны зүй болон археолог одоо энэ болгоныг хоорнд нь холбон тайлбарласан зүйлсээс бол үнэхээр нүүлчэд бол нөгөө эрсдсийн тухай ойлголт шашин шүтлэг одоо тотем бүх юм дээр бол энэ сансар охтроггүй нөгөө эрсдсийн тухай ойлголт их байдаг. Тэг ер нь гой нутгийн юм аа эзэнгүү хоосон гэж л ойлгодог байла шүү дээ саяхныг хүртэл. Тэгээд би дөхөн бол 2000 оноос хойш ер нь археологийн судалгааг хүчтэй нэлээ хүчтэй хийсэн судалгааны ажлын үр дүн гой нутгийн юм үнэхээр эртний хүмүүс, эртний нүүдэлчид, эртний монголчуудын өлгийн нутаг буюу уугуул нутаг байгаа гэдэг нь тодорхой болсон. Энийг бол тодорхой болсон гэхээр би дөхөн одоо мэдээлэлийн сан дээр л тулгуурлаж яг дурсгалын тон үзүүлэлт болон тархалтын хүрээ тухайн дурсгалын хэлбэр англи зүйн асуудал дээр нь ярих юм бол үнэхээр энэ орчимд бол 5 нь гарууд дурсгал бол бүртгэгдээд байгаа. Тэгэхээр бид бүхний одоо энэ судалгааны цар хүрээ болон та бүхний одоо хэрэгжүүлэх чага төсөл хоёр бол үнэхээр уялдаатай байх болно. Яг а тэгэхээр миний хувьд бол энэ археологийн дурсгуудын өнөөдөр тэр дурсгалыг хадгалах, хамгаалах одоо устад таниулах сурталчлах олон нийтэд одоо түүний бүх түгэн дэлгэрүүлэх зөв ойлголтыг төрүүлэх гэдэг бол би бүхний хамтын ажиллагааны үр дүн байх болов гэж би бол төсөөлж байгаа. Тийм учраас археологийн дурсгалыг бол өнөөдөр хамгаална бүтэнч баримтчуулахаас гадна түүний хадгална гэдэг бол үнэхээр том ажил байдаг. Энэ бол хамтын хөдөлмөрийн том төслүүдийн төрийх болон ажих хүн нэгжүүд шинжилгээний байгууллагын хамтын хөдөлмөрөө хийх гэсэн үг биш. Яг нэг байгууллага нэг одоо институтын хийх ажил биш байгаа юм л да. Тэгэхээр энэ бол одоо их сайхан одоо үлгэр шиш төсөл болно гэдэг би бол бүрийн итгэлтэй байгаа. Тэгм археологичд бол ер нь дурсгалыг яг л би итгэр нь барьж гар дээрээ тавьж үзэж эсвэл малтан судалж ээж л үрдөнгөө гаргадаг байсан. Сүүл үед би дөхөн одоо зайнаас тандан судлагч юм уу эсвэл одоо өөр технологийн тухай бодож эхэлж байна. Би дөхөн бас хийж хэрэгжүүлсэн олон олдвар их хэрэглэгдэхүүн бид нэр иргэж нэг харах хэрэгтэй юм байна. Би дөхөн одоо ийм аягаар одоо хөл хориант ч юм уу одоо ийм газар байх үед би дөхөн өмнөх судалгаа иргэж нэг хараад судалгаа хийх хэрэгтэй юм байна. Би дөхөн бэлтгэлтэй байх хэрэгтэй юм байна гэдэг бодол төрж байна л да. Тэгэхээр шинжлэх ухаан гэдэг бол одоо заавал очиж үзэх бид нар гараараа барьж үзэх хэвээр гээд суугаад ах биш. Харин би дөхөн энийг ямар нэгэн байдлаар өөр гарц шийдэл олох хэрэгтэй гэдгийг бид нар ойлгож байна. Тэгэхээр магадгүй археологийн судалгаа өнөөдөр маслах судалгааны олон амжилтуудаар дүүрэн байсан бол энэ байдал маань ирээд үед би дөхөн одоо тэр малцсан судалт маа олон нийт таниулах, одоо сурталчлах, мөн судалгааны хайлтыг илүү төвшөнд хүргэх, олон улсад мэдээлэх гэсэн иймэрхүү төрлөрүүгөө орох болов гэсэн тийм том юм харагдаж байна. Нэг жилийн дотор бол би дөхөн ийм юм харж анзаарч байна л да. Энэ Марс төсөлтэй яг холбоод Марс төслийн энэ концепц өнцгөөс нь говийг авч үзэх юм бол үнэхээр маш чухал концепц гэж харж байгаа. Зөв чухал концепц гэж харж байгаа. Тэгэхээр ягаад гэхдээр дүнгэж хил гараад одоо энэ Монголын одоо Гоби дисерт буюу энэ гов цөл дээр олон ийм scientific tour маягийн төслүүдийг хатдууд хэрэгжүүлж байгаа. Тухайлбал одоо манай одоо тэр хамтарч ажиллаж байгаа хэдтэн эрдэнтэн судлаачд хамтраад бид нар кубуч хийгээд ордост байрлах элсэн зүйл байгаа. Энийг бол хэрхэн хүн хэрвээ хүсэх юм бол ногоорулаад давхар аялж уулчлалыг хөгжүүлж болдгийг бол харуулж чадж байгаа. Дээр нь бол одоо дунхаа гэдэг одоо торгоны замын одоо баян бүрд байна. Тэрийг мөн адилхан түүх археологийн талын олдвырыг Яаж одоо дэлхийн нийтэд таниулж чадж байгаа нь тод жишээ энэ одоо говийн бүс дээр байгаа. Нэг талаас ингээд харах дээр говийн цөл бол ул ингээд одоо халуун хүн амьдрах тохиромжгүй мөртлөөсөө нөгөө талдаа бол ул тэнд дээр хэрвээ тасан цогцох юм зөв бодлогыг явуулах юм бол ул бид нар энэ дээр бол ул амьдрал байх бүрэн боломж байна гэдгийг хэл гараад олон юм жишээнээс харж болно. А тийм учраас бол ул энэ гов цөл дээр хэрэгжүүлж байгаа марс төслийн концепц бол бүрэн хэрэгжих болцоотой гэж судлаач хүний хувьд бол харж байгаа юм л да. За манайх 2015 онд төлжилтийн 
тархалтын зураг гэж гаргасан тэр зургаар бол Монгол орны нийт нутаг төвсөрийн 76 хувь нь ямар нэгэн хэмжээгээр цөлжилт газрын дорвотлд өртсөн байна гэж гаргасан. Тэр та сая дурдсан тэр сүүлийн 100 жилд дэлхийн 1 кэрацар дуулаарлаа. Гэтэл Монгол орнд бол аа одоо бид нар одоо ингээд энэ хэмжилтүүдийг хийж ихэлсэн 1940 оод оноос тооцох юм бол үндсэндээ 2.1 кэрацар дэлхийгээс дариу 2 дахин илүү юм дуулаарл Монгол орнд бий болсон байна гэж а судалгаагаар гарсан. За давхар бас энэ хой тагст байгаа одоо энэ хангаан бүсэд байгаа цэвдэгтэй газар нутагт бол температур 1 градусаар дуулаарсан сүүлийн 60 жилд гэсэн ийм тооцоолуудыг гаргасан. Тэгэхээр цөлжилт бол явагдаж байгаа. За энэ нь бол мэдээж олон хүчин зүйл байгаа. Байгалийн дуулааралт холбоотой хүчин зүйл. Тэрнээс гадна хүний сүрг үйл ажиллагаанаас болж энэ үйл үйл явц бол илүү хурдсаж байгаа зүйлсүүд байгаа. Бид бүхэн бол одоо өнөөдөр нэг боломжтой нөхцөл төр байгаа нь ажиллагын дөрөвдүгээр хөвсөл дижитал хөвсөл гэж харж байгаа. За олон одоо нэгдүгээр хөвсөл хоёр дугаар хөвсөл гурав дугаар хөвсөлийг ингээ аваад үзэх юм бол хугацааны хувьд бол сүүлийн жилүүд сүүлийн хөвсөлүүд бол богино хугацаанд явагдаж байгаа. А гэхдээ энэ ажиллагын дөрөвдүгээр хөвсөлийг бол Яг залуу хүн судлаач хүний эрдэмтэн хүний тухайд авахд бол энэ бол бид нар том боломжийг өгч байгаа. Бид нар нэг гараанаас гарах боломжтой юм байна. Энэ бол ухта бол оюуны хөвсгөл юм байна. Тийм учраас энэ хөвсгөлийн боломжийг бол манай Монгол залуу чул ашиглах хэрэгтэй гэсэн ийм нэгдүгээр үндсэн зорилго санаа байна. За хоёр дугаарт бол биднэрийн одоо жил болгон төвшүүлж явдаг нэг өрөө бол ер нь одоо мэдлэгийг нийгэмшүүлэх асуудал бол их чухал болж байгаа. А International Science Council-оос ч гэсэн ер нь хэдэ ийм зорилго зорилтыг тавьж ажиллаж байгаа. Та мэдлэгтэй байх юм бол тэр мэдлэгийг хүмүүст одоо хүргэх нь бол хамгийн чухал юм аа. Тэгжиж бүгдөөр ашиг шимийн хүртэж бүгдөөрөө тогтвортой гар урт хугацаанд хөвчих юм аа гэдэг байгаа. Өөрөөр хэлэх юм бол энэ маань бол соён гигэрүүлэх талын зүйлс рүүгээ илүү нөгөө ашиг байсан бол ихлээ шинлүхэн гэдэг зүйл бизнесийн одоо моделийг илүү ашигтай болгох тал руу нэг хэсэг хэлбэж явсан бол одоо буцаад бүгдийн соён гигэрүүлэх одоо тэг шимтэйгээр мэдлэг хүртэх тэр нэр бол тогтвортой хөгжил байгальтай ихтэйгээр усаа хэмнэдэг ач холбогдлын ойлгодог ийм тал руугаа явж эхэлж байгаа. Тэгэхээр энэ тал руу бол бид нар өөрт байгаа мэдлэгээ хуваалцах тал руу бол ажиллах хэвстэн байна гэсэн ийм концепцор бид нар ажиллаж байгаа. За Гурав тахныг асуудал бол Монгол улс бол цаашдаа ер нь мэдлэг зөвлөс эдийн засгийг хөгжүүлж явах хэвээр. Энэ нь бол 2 3 хан хүчин зүйлийг дуртахд болж байгаа. Нэгдүгээрт бол хүн ам цөв. А хөдөлмөрийн тийм учраас хүн ам цөв орон бол хөдөлмөрийн багтаамжтай бүтээгт хүнхээс өвлөө оюуны багтаамжтай бүтээгт хүн гаргаж ижил бид нар дэлхийд гарна. А тэр боловсоог бол одоо шинжлэх ухааны салбар олгоно. А мэдээж бид нар ингээд зэрэгцэд зогсоод 3 сая хүн тэр тэр бүм гарын хүнтэй зах зээлтэй ингээд зэрэгцэд ажил хийх юм бол хэзээш энд бол өрсөлдөг чадвартай байж чадах. Тэгм учраас бид нар цаашдаа бол энэ оюуны шах хөгдөтгүй тэр нөөцөө ашигласан ийм хөгжилрүүл явах хэрэгтэй гэсэн юм цанаагаар манай холбоо ажилладаг. Тэгээ тэр болгондоо бол тус тусдаа дуу холоогоо өргөөд нарийн судалгаа руугаа бүгдөөр бол ороод явж байгаа. А ер нь яг саяын тэр а оо гофтой холбоотой энэ марс төсөлтэй холбоотой манай хүрээлэн тухайл бол энэ төсөл дээр ямар оролцоотой байж болох вэ гэдэг дээр би 2 3 хүн санал хэлэх юм шиг. Нэгдүгээрт бол яг тэр цөлийн бүсэд бол ямар ургамлыг ямар модыг таримлжуулж болох хэвээр юм бэ гэдгийг бид нар одоо судалж байна. А Дорногов аймгийн сүмбэр сум дээр ингээ урт хугацааны мониторинг сайт буюу одоо ингээ судалгааны талбай байгуулаад тэгээд эн чинь бол нэг одоо нэг жил судлаач юм уу үр дүн гарахгүй тийм учраас урт хугацаанда судалж ий за ийм хөрсчлүүлэгтэй ийм газар энэ ургамал байгалийн аргаараа ингэж урах юм байна жоохон одоо эрдэс бодис ус нэмээд ингэж урах юм байна гэдэг ийм нарийн технологиудыг гаргаж явдаг тэрүүгээрээ бид нар хамтарч болно хоёр дугаарт бол аа хамгийн чухал зүйл бол ус байгаа хүн хаана байна үлдвэрл хааны үгд нь тэнд бол усны хэрэгцээ гардаг Тэр нэг оюун бүсэд усаа яа шийдэх вэ гэдэг асуудал байгаа. Тэм учраас усыг бол хоёр аргаар шийдэх боломжтой. Нэг нь бол одоо тэр гоюун бүс рүү гүний усыг ашиглах боломжтой. Тэгэхээр гүний ус нь бол ингээд бид нар сүулд бол нэг стопинг 
алгаар насын тогтоогоод одоо тухайн бол говийн нэг айлын худаг гэдэг бол уу нэг 110 жилийн настай ус байхад жоохон доошоо гүндлүү ингээд өрмдөд дээж аваад үзэх юм бол нэг 35 20 мянган жилийн настай ус нууд байх тэрэг бол бид нар гадаргын үсээ татах тийм болцоотой тэр техник гэдэг нь судалгаануудыг бас хийж болохсон. Гэхмэчлэн энэ төсөл цааш уур тогцоонтой хөвгчүүд бол яах аргагүй энэ шил ухааннуудын байгууллагын нэгдсэн тийм зохион байгуулалт хэрэгтэй гэдэг нь бол харагдаж байгаа. За дараагийн нэг зүйл бол яг манай хүрээлэн дээр ремонт сайнсэн буюу одоо зайны стандарт сэтл чиглэлийн сектор лаборатори ажилладаг. За мөн одоо э газар зүй мэдээллийн системийн одоо Монголд анх байгуулагдсан лаборатори бас манад 96 оноос хойш ингээ хөвжээ гэж байгаа. Тэр тэр хоёр лаборатори юу хийдэг вэ гэхээр агаа сансрын мэдээн дээр ажиллаж а техник технологи ин ин давуу талыг ашиглаж дэлхийн гадаргыг одоо зургалж ялангуяа Монголын одоо энэ уур амьсгалын өөрчлөлт давхар энэ ургамлын индекс ургамлын бүрхэц За дээрэнд гэл бэлчээртэй ойтой устай гадрах устай бол одоо бүх төр тандан судалгааг бол бид нар агаар сансрын мэдээн дээр ашиглаж хийдэг. Тэр бид нар нэг дутагч байгаа зүйл бол Монгол өөрөө хиймэл дагуул байхгүй. Тэм учраас Монголын хиймэл дагуулыг хөөрхөх тэр энэ төлхөлтийг бас энэ марш төсөл хийж өгөх байх гэж харж байгаа. Бид нар өөрөө ингэсэн хиймэл дагуултай бол одоо дэлхийн төвшний Судалгааны үр дүнг бол бид нар гаргаж чадхаар тийм одоо ноу хоо ур чадвар яг одоо нэг манай Монголын энэ зал үрдэмтэд бол авцсан байгаа. Аялчуулчлын салбар бол дэлхийд ахинд одоо химийн үйлдвэрл, эмийн үйлдвэрлийн дараа ордог хоёр гурав дахь том эдийн засгийн салбар байгаа. За тэгэхээр аялчуулчлын салбар маань 2019 онд бол нийт 1.4 тэрбум орчим хүн дэлхийд ахинд аялж 1.7 их найд орчим ам долларын орлогыг бүрдүүлж исэн. Тэгэхээр энэ салбарт бас 300 орчим сая ажлын байрыг бий болгодог. Тэгэхээр энэ салбар маань өөрөө эдийн засаг нийгмийн хувьтай одоо дээрэсэн соёлын үеийн хамгаалал шинжлэх ухаан судалгааны чиглэлд бол маш их одоо зөвхөн шууд өрөөгөөжиг өгөхөөс гадна дам нөлөө ихтэй. За энэ салбарыг дагч хөөчдөг маш олон худалдаа үйлчлэгээ тээврийн салбарууд байдаг. Тэгэхээр энэ өөрөө бас одоо Монгол улсын ирээдүйн хөгжлийн гол тулгуур салбараа ингэж Монгол улсын засгийн газраас үзэж байгаа. За тэгэхээр Монгол улсын хувьд бол аялжуулчлал өөрөө гол экспортын ул урхаан дараа ордог хоёрдогч экспортын салбар. За 2019 оны хувьд тэ цар тахлаас өмнөх 2019 оны тоо баримтаар аваад үзэхэд Монгол улсад 577 орчим мянган гадаадын жуулчин аялж За тэдгээрээс Монгол улсын эдийн засагт 1.6 орчим их найт төгрөгийн орлогыг бүрдүүлсэн байдаг. За дотоодын жуулчдын маань урсгал эдийн засгийн урсгал 800 орчим тэрбумд төрсөн. Тэгэхээр нийт аялжуулчлын эдийн засгийн урсгал маань 2 их найт төгрөгт хүрж байгаа гэдэг нь яг одоо малаач хүн салбараас баг илүү гарах хэмжээний юм салбар. Тэгээ нөгөөтэйгөөр цэвэр одоо валютын орлогыг те эдийн засагт оруулдаг гэдгээрээ бид нар цаашдаа яагаад одоо аялжуулчлыг хөгжүүлэх хэвээр байна гэдэг нь бол ойлгомжтой харагдаж байна гэж ингэж бодож байна. Тэгэхээр аялжуулчлын сал бар маань өөрөө бас хөрөнгө оруулалтаа Монгол улсад хамгийн хурдан хугацаанд нөхдөг бизнесийн салбар за нөгөөтэйгөөр зам тээвэр агаарын тээвэр худалдаа үйлчлэгийн салбарын одоо худалдан борлуулалтыг бол 25-аас дээшвэр буюу бусад одоо эдийн засгийн салбаруудаас хамгийн их хуваар дэмждэг юм салбар байгаа. Тэгэхээр зөвхөн аялжуулчлыг хөгжүүлнэ гэдэг нь тухайн нэг салбарын асуудал биш. Үүнийг дагаж байгаа бусад салбаруудын эдийн засгийн гарцыг бол одоо маш их хэмжээнд дэмжих боломжтой. Нөгөөтэйгөөр одоо Монгол улсад үйлдвэрлэгдэж байгаа брэнд бүтээгт хүнүүд те жишээлбэл одоо говийн кашмирч гэдэг юм уу. Энэ салбаруудын дотоодоос бид нар экспортлох боломжийг бүрдүүлж байгаа гол юм салбар. Тэгэхээр бид нар одоо гадагшаа экспортыг хөгжүүлнэ гэж яриад бол аялжуулчлыг хөгжүүлснээр бид нар гадны жуулчдыг авчраад газар дээрээсээ экспорт хийх боломжийг бүрдүүлж байна гэж ингэж ойлгож болно. Тэгэхээр эдийн засгийн хувьд бол бид нар одоо хоёр дахь экспортын салбар урт хугацаанда баг те ул урхаан өмнө орох боломжтой ийм потенциал байгаа гэж ингэж үздэг. 
Тэгэхээр Монгол улсын засгийн газар бол урт хугацаандаа олон дунд хугацаандаа баримтлах бодлого маань уул уурхайгаас хараад бас эдийн засгийг хөгжүүлэх, эдийн засгийг төрөлжүүлэхэд бол гол чиг хандлагаа одоо тавьж байна, зорж байна. Тэгэхээр энэ хүрээнд бол аялжуулчлын салбарыг бол тэргүүлэх эдийн засгийн нэг салбарын одоо нэг болгож хөгжүүлэх ингэж зорьсон. Тэгтээ аялжуулчлын хөгжүүлэхийн тулд бид нар бас анхаарах шаардлагатай асуудлууд байна. За 1100 одоо 57 оноос хойш Монгол улсын аялжуулчлын салбар хөгжөхтөө уламжлалт аялжуулчлын одоо чиглэл хандлагуудыг дагж ингэж хөгжиж ирсэн жараа жилийн одоо түүхэн ийм уламжлал байна. Тэгэхээр энэ бол одоо хөвсгөл а горих төрөлж за тэгээ говийн хідэн амгуудыг холбсон энэ аялжуулчлын үндсэн нэг алтан гуурулжинг барьж хөгжиж ирсэн. Гэтэл цаашдаа бид нэр энэ аялжуулчлын салбараас бүс нутаг болгон өөрийн онцлогийг одоо давуу тала болгож аялжуулчлын салбараас үр үр өгөөжийг хүртэх. За дээрэс нь тэр бүс нутагт эдийн засаг нийгмийн хөгжлийг бий болгох. А нөгөө тэгвэр ялангуяа нэг ялангуяа одоо энэ аялжуулчлын салбараас тухайн орон нутгийн иргэд өөрөө үр өгөөжийг хүртдэг байх. За түүгээр дамжуулаад тухайн орон нутгийн одоо байгаль түүх соёлын үүдийг бид нэр хамгаалах, олон улсад сурталчлан таниулах, өвлүүлэх гэдэг энэ асуудлууд бас одоо шинээр бий болж байна. Тэгэхээр Монгол улсын засгийн газар бол цаашдаа бид нэр энэ зөвхөн уламжлалт явж байгаа аялжуулчлынхаа чиглэл, хандлагуудыг төрөлжүүлэх, за бүтээгт хөгжилгээний өөр хоорондоо ялгаатай байдлыг бий болгох За тэр дундаа бүс нутаг болгон өөрсдөө өөрийн байгаа байгаль түүх соёлын онцлогоо давуу тал болгоод тухайн бусад бүс нутгаасаа одоо ялгаатай хөгжих энэ боломжийг бүрдүүлье гэж ингэж зорж байгаа. Тэгэхээр энэ хүрээнд бол бид нар одоо Ази хөгжлийн банкны санхүүжилттэй одоо төсөл хөтөлбөрүүдийг хэрэгжүүлж эхэлсэн. За 2020-оос 24 онд бол бид нар одоо зүүн бүсийн аймгуудад түүхэн аялжуулчлал, за хөвсгөл чиглэл рүү тогтвортой байгалийн аялжуулчлал За баруунсын аймгууд рүү энэ Монголын бит бус соёлын үед тулгуурсан аялжуулчлын хөгжүүлье гэж ингэж зорж байгаа. Тэгэхээр энэ Марс төсөл маань шинжлэх ухааны аялалжуулчлыг одоо төшгөлсөн тусгай сонирхлын аялжуулчлын төрөл хэлбэрүүдийг говийн бүсийн бүс нутагт одоо чиглүүлэх, татах ийм одоо ач холбогдолтой одоо төсөл болж харагдаж байгаа. Тэгэхээр энэ бол одоо Монгол улсын засгийн газрын аялжуулчлын салбарт баримтлах дунд олон урт хугацааны бодлогоо бол шууд одоо бүрэн уйлцж байгаа гэж ингэж үзэж байгаа. А нөгөө төгөр бид нар бас Монголын гов гэдэг бол одоо олон улсын аялжуулчлын зах зээл дээр ялангуяа одоо энэ шинэ мянганы тий зэ чинэрэй шин миллениалс гэж байгаа энэ маш их одоо жилдээ дөрөөс тавуудагийн давтамжтай аялдаг бас энэ зах зээл дээр Монголын гов гэдэг бол одоо яалтчгүй заавал зорчих хэвээр нэг топ дестинейшн энийг болсон. Тэгэхээр энэ говийг бид нар шинэ одоо бусад говиудаас ялгаатай өнгө төрхөөр зах зээл санал болох гэж байна. Энэ бол одоо урт хугацаандаа маш их эдийн засгийн үр өгөөжийг тогтмол өгөх боломжийг бид нар бас бий болгож байна гэж ингэж үзэж байгаа. Тэгэхээр энэ төсөл маань одоо аялжуулчлын талаасаач нийгэм эдийн засаг шинжлэх ухааны талаасаач засгийн газрын үйл ажиллагаа хөтөлбөртөө бүрэн уйлдаж байна гэж ингэж үзэж болно. За нөгөө төгөр энэ төслийг хэрэгжүүлэх явцад бол бас төсөл маань өөрөө том бүтэн байгуултад суурилалгүй те яг одоо байгаль орчны одоо өнөөгийн байдлыг бүрэн хадгалах цаашдаа урт хугацаандаа сөрөг нөлөөгөө байх а тухайн байгаль орчонд одоо бас байгаль орчны нуур амьсгалын өөрчлөлтийг судлах энэ ажлуудыг цогцоор энэ төсөл маань зөвхөн аялжуулчлал биш те шинжлэх ухааны судалгаатай хамтаар ингэж хийх нөхцөлийг бүрдүүлж байгаа гэдгээр одоо төслөөс байгаль орчонд үзүүлэх сөрөг нөлөөлөл а тухайн одоо говийн бүс нутагт байгаа тэр байгалийн одоо биеийн байдлыг цаашдаа урт хугацаандаа бид нэр алдагдуулахгүй байх нөхцөлийг бас хангаж байгаа. Тэгэхээр аялжуулчлын томоохон төслүүдэд гардаг одоо алдааг энэ төсөл давтгүй ахад анхнаас анхаарч байгаа гэдгээр бас засгийн газрын одоо бүрэн дэмжлэгийг авч байгаа гэж ингэж ойлгож болно. Тэгэхээр ер нь эцэст нь одоо дүгнэт хэлэхэд энэ марс Тэ а марсаар одоо төлөөл үлж байгаа Монголын говийг олон улсын аялжуулчлын зах зээлд гарах гэж зорж байгаа энэ төслийг бол а Монгол улсын аялжуулчлын салбарыг бүсжилж хөгжүүлэх тэр дундаа аялжуулчлал Монгол улсын аялжуулчлал өөрөө олон улсын зах зээл дээр өөр өнцгөөр өөр одоо имежээр тэ харагдах а борлуулагдах энэ боломжийг бас бүрдүүлж байгаа нэг юм чухал төсөл гэж ингэж үзэж байгаа. А нөгөө төгөр бид нар урт хугацаандаа аялжуулчлын салбараас бол эдийн засгийн үр өгөөжийг энэ төслөөр дамжуулж хүртэх боломжийг бас бүрдүүлнэ. За тэгээд төслийг бас уйлдуулаад энэ төсөл маань бас засгийн газрын үйл ажиллагааны арвижилсэн төлгөөнд бас тусаад явж байгаа. Тэгэхээр төсөлтөө уйлдуулаад бид нар одоо аялжуулчлынхаа салбарын бодлогоодыг бас бүрэн уйлдуулаад зам тээврийнх нь одоо агаарын тээвэр, зам тээвэр бусад одоо 
тэд бүтэц дахсан салбруудын төлгөөг бас давхар хийгээд явахад бүрэн боломжтой болж байна гэж ингэж үзэж байна. За тэгээд юуны өмнө танаас нэтрүүлт тоолж байгаа бас их баяртай байна. За өнөөдөр бол Монгол улсын хэмжээнд бол газар нутгийн 21 өн одоо Монгол улсын засгийн малтай газар хариулж байна. За үүн дотроо 120 одоо нэг талбар газрыг 715 нэг талбай хагчтай 34 хамгаалалтын зарганы та амгалтаар хариуцсан амгалж байгаа юм аа. Эр нь бол монголчууд эртээр үеэс бас газар нутгаа хамгаалж ирсэн түүхэн сайхан уламжлалтай юм аатуу байна. За энэ Марс төсөл бол одоо яхаар гомоноо засгийн газраас барьж байгаа болох яамнаас барьж байгаа болохтой бас нийтэж байгаа юм төсөл байна аа. За ер нь тусгай амгалтай газар дээр тав төрөө хүндэж байна. Ер нь бол одоо тэр байгаль орчондоо ээлтэй а тэр тэнд амьдарч байгаа хар дэргэдтэй бас тий. Одоо гөөчтөө ийм тал дээр бас төрийн бодлого бол явж байгаа А 2016 оны 12 дахь сарын 28-ний 10 дахь тогтоол гарсан байна гэсэн юм. Сагаан малтай газар дээр газар ашиглах хэцүү шүүлэх. А төсөл сонгон жолоор болох юм журмын гаргаа батлсан байгаа. За энэ дээр энэ цаашдаа бид нар Монгол улсын сагаан малтай газар дээр энэ аялжуулсан чиглэлээр бол том том одоо төсөл сонгон жолоор болох юм аа. Одоо яа жишээлбэл би Марс төслийг бол онцлоод байна л. Энэ замаар одоо газар ашиглуулах энэ тал руугаа одоо бодлого юм аа гэж бодож байгаа юм байна. Ер нь одоо ганц Монгол улс ингээд дэлхийн газар нутга засгийн болон даавдаг асуудал биш л дээ. Сая төрөнд та яаж уур амьдралын өөрчлөлт дэлхийн нийтийн асуудал болж байгаа үед бол бид нэр яг харахгүй энэ газар нутга хамгаалтанд авч хамгаалтанд авсан замаа одоо тухайн экосистемийн одоо тий тэр бүрэн бүтэн байдлыг хангах юм одоо төрийн бодлого бодлого болох хэмжээнд одоо ирчихэд. За манай Монгол улсын хувьд бол одоо дэлхийд бол одоо аль одоо 92 онд одоо Монгол улсынхаа газар нутгийн 21 өв төрнэ гэж одоо нүби ингэдэг дээрээс одоо ингэж ярьсан. ийм одоо тэр үлгэр жишээ сайхан одоо юм байна. Одоо дэлхийн өөрөө дуураад ихлээ Европын одоо холбоод одоо энэ дээр нэгдээд ихлээ. Ер нь газар нутгийн тусгай хамгаалтанд авч одоо тий авснаар одоо энэ уур амьсгалын өөрчлөлтийг бид нар одоо даван тул чадах юм аа гэдэг ийм одоо төрийн юу дэлхийн бодлого хүртэл одоо энэ дөө ярьсан. Энэ дотроо манай хол одоо 30 өв төрнө гэж тогтолтой хөгжил 2030 за 2050 алсын араа тодорхой заатсан байгаа. За үн дотроо бол одоо бүр газар нутгийн 30 үе одоо Монгол улсын сагаан хамгаалтанд авах А дээр нь одоо ус бүрэлдэх хийх үед үе цэнгүү хүсний их юм одоо 55 одоо тэгээ цаашдаа 60 үеийг одоо Монгол улсын засгийн хамтанд авах ийм одоо том том зориулт бодлого төрийн бодлогод одоо явж байгаа. За ер нь бол тулгамцсан асуудал бол одоо байна. За жишээлбэл манай Монгол бол одоо уламжлал мал авчих хэрэг хэлдэг. Тийм ээ нүдлийн одоо ийм ахуутай улс. За энэ дээр одоо малын одоо бэлчээр тийм малын даац. За өнтөө холбоот байгаа нэг зэрлэг амьтны одоо нутаг тэр одоо бэлчээр талх нутгаа одоо бас улаацлах асуудал бас байна. За уур амьсгалын өөрчлөлтөө холбоот тоогоор энэ хөрсний одоо сүлжлэлтийн асуудал байлаа. За дээр нь одоо нэмэгдээд энэ аялжуулалтын холбоотой бас нөөц даацын асуудал ч гэсэн одоо бас тусгаан малтай газар дээр өнөөдөр өсөлж байгаа аялал зам болчиход байна л та. За үн дээр би таны ялсан төрүүнээр бид нар одоо энэ аялжуулалтын даац тий энэ эко аялжуулал одоо дэлхийн бол одоо тогтвортой аялжуулалт гэсэн тусгаан малтай газар дээр аялсны өөр дэлхийн байгаль хамгаалалт одоо холбооноос барьж байгаа одоо манай шаардлага гоё тийм дэлхийн удаа ярьж байгаа бодлого бол тусгай амлалтай газар дээр энэ эко аялжуулал явах хэрэгтэй байна. За төр та хөндлөө. Тэнд амьдарч байгаа тэр нутгийн иргэдийг дэмтсэн тий нутгийн иргэдийн оролцоотой. За хамгаалалтын менежмент ч гэсэн өнөөдөр төр одоо дангаараа хамгаалалтаа байх биш. Тэр устаа нуруны бас нашал парки тоо таас ярьж байна. Энэ төр хуу хэлсэн төнжлийн үрэнд бас хамгаалалт тий. Иргэд одоо нөхрөл хэлбэрээр одоо тусгай амлалтай газар авдаг. Энэ засгийн хэлбэрүүд рүү бид нар одоо төлхөө одоо бодлого гарч байгаа гэсэн юм бас байр суурьтай байгаа юм. Төрөн би сая ярилла бас энэ тэр засгийн одоо олон хэлбэр байна манай. За жишээлбэл хууль эрхцэн орчноор хамгаалах үе одоо манай тусгай амлалтай газар тий. Тодорхой газар нутгийг төрийн бодлогоор хамгаалж байгаа нэг засгийн хэлбэр. За нөгөө засгийн хэлбэр бол төр хувийн өвшил олон улсын байгууллага ийм хүрээнд хамгаалж байгаа. Тэр устаа нашаа паркын парк хэмжээнд таас ярилла. За иргэд үе нөхрөлөл орон нутгийн одоо а байгууллагууд нийлээд одоо хамгаалах хэрэгтэй нь хэлдэг. За жишээлбэл би их нартыг би хэлээ гэж бодсон. Их нартын байгалийн засгийн газар бол одоо орон нутаг хамгаалаад явж байгаа юм хамгаалалтын менежмент. За энэ том төсөл сонгон шалбарлах замаар тусгай амлалтай газар дээр газар ашиглах энэ эрхцэн орчмол Монгол одоо нээлттэй байгаа. Энд дээр одоо үе үеийн засгийн газрын тогтоол, шийдвэрүүд а хууль эрхцэн орчмол бол одоо хангалттай гэж бодсон. А энэ цаашдаа бид нар бүс нутгийн хэмжээнд а аялжуулалтыг одоо энэ том том төсөл хөтөлбөрийн сонгон жолоолох замаар энэ аялжуулалтыг одоо засгийн малтай зөвхөн нэвтрүүлэх зүйтэй юм байна. 
эргээд одоо тэр экран эргэд тэд нь ээлтэй байгаль орсондоо сөрөг нөлөөгүй ийм том том төлөвлөрийг хэрэгжүүлэхээр бид нар одоо зорин адилж байгаа болно. Нэг номыг ингээ олон хүмүүс уншлаа гэхэд уншсан хүн болгонд өөр өөр юм гэсэн төсөөлөл бий болдог. А хэрвээ түүгээр ингээ кино хийгээд найр дөчин шийдлээр ямар нэг кино бий болох юм бол тэрний талаар хүмүүсийн дунд гол дүр болон өрөнж байгаа хот тосгодын талаар нэг ижилхэн төсөөлөл бий болдог. Энэ ижилхэн төсөөлөл энэ ижилхэн стандарт маягийн төсөөлөл олон хүмүүсийн хооронд нь нэгтгэдэг. Магадгүй өөр өөр ихрөө төсөөлөл явж байх нь амттай байж болгоч. Олуулаа нэг ижилхэн төсөөлөлтэй байх, нэг ижилхэн зорилгын үүдэс харж байхын хүч гэж байдаг. Энэ хүчэл агуу үүсүүдийг агуу бүтээн байгуулалтыг бий болгодог гол хөдлөгч хүч байдаг болов гэж битгэдэг. Манай манга багийн хэвд тулахаар Марс би төслийн ирээдүйн хүмүүст ярих биш, хилэх биш харуулах хэрэгтэй болсон. Мянга сонсохоор нэг удаа үз гэж үг байдаг. Яг түнтэй адилхан одоо хүмүүсийн анх удаа сонсож байгаа, хоёр дахь удаагаа сонсож байгаа, мянга дахь удаагаа сонсож байгаа Марс би төслийн талх ирээдүйн бид нар хүмүүст харуулах хэрэгтэй болсон. Ирээдүйн талаарх төсөөлөл нь нэг ижил хүмүүс, нэг ижил зорилготой хүмүүс, нэг юмд нэг янзаар итгэж байгаа хүмүүсийн хүч чадал боломж болцоо гэдэг хязгаарлагдчихгүй их гэж төсөөлөгддөг. Хэвээ бид нэг ийм төсөөлөлтэй байж чадах юм бол урагшлахад бий болсон саадыг даван туулахад тэмцэхэд ирээд үгэн бүтэн байгуулахад бидэнд хэр баргийн саад огтхон цаад болохгүй гэж би бодож байна. Ямар ч барилга байгууламж, ямар ч бүтэн байгууллт ихлээд хүний оюун санаанд дотор бий болдог. Тэгээд дараа нь хүмүүс хоорондоо тэр оюун санаанд бий болсон төсөөлөл хуваацдаг. Тэр төсөөлөлд нь хэрэг олон хүн итгэж чадна, хэр олон хүн тэрийг нэг ижил янзаар олж харж чадна. Тэр хэмжээгээр тэр бүтэн байгуулалт, тэр барилга байгууламж, тэр агуу үйлс бодитор бий болох магадлал нь ихсдэг. А магадгүй нэгэнт бий болцсны дараа тэр завсрын үе шат болох төсөл, зураг, план тэд нар хэрэггүй болдог гэж магадгүй. Тэгтэл ямар ч зүй бүтэн бий болохын тулд эцсийн шатнаас ихний шат хоёрын хооронд маш олон завсрын үе шат байдаг. Тэдгээрийн нэг нь одоо Марс бид төслийн үед бид нарийн манга юм болов гэж боддог. Ирээдүйн хот ямар байх вэ? Ирээдүйн технологи ямар байх вэ? Монголын говд ямар ирээдүй бий болох вэ? Тэнд ирсэн эрдэмтэд юун дээр ажиллах вэ? Тэнд ирсэн зоригтонгууд ямар адал явдал туулах вэ? Энэ одоо хүн болгоны толгойд өөр өөрийнхөө төсөөлөгдөж байгаа тэгвэл энийг бид нар нэгтгэж чадвал, нэг болгож чадвал нэг зоригийн хөндлө бид нар бүгд зүтгэж чадна. Яг энэ л ачааг, энэ л асуудлыг бид нар шийдэх гэж баг жил гараа ажилласан. Тэгээд өнөөдөр бид нар хийсэн бүтээсэн зүйлийг хаад гарчаа. Та бүхэнд хуваацсан бэлэн болсон байна. Тийм болохоор танд байгаа, танд байгаа, танд байгаа төсөөлүүдийг бид нэгтгэхэд нэг болгоод хүн болгоны өөр өөр төсөөлж байгаа тэр ирээдүйг өнөөдөр тавчраад хүн болгонд бидний ирээдүй ийм шүүдэ гэж харуулахын тулд бид нар бүтэн жилийн турш ажилласан. Бүтэн жилийн турш энэ хүнд хэцүү ажлыг нугалах гэж бид нар нэг сайн болсон гэж мэдхгүй ч гэсэн хамаг байдгаар хичээж ажилласан. Тэгээд бид нар энэ ажлыг хаард гарчаад одоо та бүхэнд хуваацсан бэлэн болсон байна. Тэгээд хэдүүлээ нэг ижил төсөөл нэг ижил зорилгын хөндлөө хамтдаа хичээцгээе. За сайн байцгаа нөө. Аваг бэлэн гэдэг би марс бид төслийн артурын багийн ахлагчаар ажиллаж байна. Манай баг 10-той орчим гишүүнтэй бид төр өнгөрсөн жил гарын хугацаанд марс бид төслийн багийн хамтдаа хамтран мөн гадаадын судалгааны байгууллагатай хамтран марс бид төслийн дизайн хөгжүүлэлт гадар зохион байгууллалт материал судлал бусад барилга байгууламж гэх мэт концепцийн хөгжүүлэн ажиллаж байна. Манай энэ концепцийн чиглэлүүд бол үйл ажиллагаанаасаа хамаарад барилгын загварууд маань хагас дугуй хэлбэртэй. За тэгээд энэ газар дуурах байгууламж юм уу олон төрөл байгаа. За бид нар ер нь яг барилга байгууламж гэхээсээ илүү хүн амьдрахад тохирох хүч төр очныг бүрдүүлэх тэг жижиг хэмжээ нь хот маягийн юм ор төсөөлж одоо энэ концепцийг хийж байгаа. Тэгээд бид нар тэр жижиг хэмжээний хот дотроо барилга байгууламжаа барьж хоол хүнсээ ургуулж тэ за тэ усаа бэлдэж эрчим хүчний технологи хөгжүүлэх юм уу бос бүх технологи хөгжүүлээд за тэгээд а дараагийн ирэх хүмүүсээ хүмүүсээ ирэх тэ оршин нөхсөн бүрдүүлж дурт хугацаанд амьдрах урт удаан хугацаанд амьдрах тэр оршиныг бүрдүүлэхийн төлөө энэ технологиг одоо босруулаад явж байна за 
өнөөдөр дэлхий дээр одоо Марс гариг дээр барилга байгуулж барих энэ өрсөлдөө энэ уралдаанд маш олон актуурын компани маш олон компаниуд ингээд хүч үзэн уралдаж ажиллаж байна. За бид төр Монголын говд энэ технологиг хөгжүүлсэн технологи Монголын говд туршиж энэ уралдаанд манлаалах нь бидний одоо гол зорилго юм аа. За одоо манай төсний концепцийн хамгийн гол зүйл бол энэ дөм хэлбэртэй байгууламж байгаа энэ байгууламж байна манай Монгол гэрийн үндсэн концепцийг шингээсэн. За тэгээд уг хэлбэр бидний сонгосон уг хэлээр маань энэ Марс гаргийн эртдэс уур амьсгал энэ хөрсний бүтц энэ зэрэг хамгийн хамгийн төхөрөмжтэй тэгээ энэ судалгаагаар батлагдсан хэлбэр байгаа. Манай Марс үед төсөн академийн үндсэн концепц бол бид нар энэ дэлхийн олон улсын байгууллагуудын бүтээж буй одоо магадгүй энэ Араб нэгдсэн Эмират улс, Хятад улс тий өөр бусад улсуудын бүтээж буй концепц бол ирсэн жоох ялгаатай байгаа. Юугаараа ялгаатай вэ одоо тэр улсууд маань ихвчлэн доо мэдрэг барьж байгаа бол бид нар концептийн санаагаад тэр далайн гүний тэр олон жил тэр далайн гүний амьд бол өөртөө маш даралт маш их авдаг. Тэгээ тэрийг судлаад тэр судалсан амьдлуудын хэлбэр дүрс тий энэ бүгдээс ингээ санаа авч биш нэр ингээ концепц босруулж байгаа. Энэ концепц маань магадгүй хүн харахад ингээ чихүү зэрэг нь нэгүү санагдах боловч энэ Марсын энэ эртдэс уур амьсгал магадгүй төр Марсын төр хөрсөнд илүү тохирсон ийм хэв шинжиг агуулсан ийм хэлбэрүүд юм аа. Okay, good morning. I'm holding in my hand this football ball made in Mongolia. It's made in a uh, handmade and uh, inside rubber I was told was brought imported from Brazil. Outside cover is made from Mongolian hide. And now it's being exported to Europe, to Germany. So you might ask why or what to do with environmentally friendly technological transfer. Almost 90% of the soil in capital city is polluted and contaminated by dangerous microbes and viruses. Here we come, uh, we have Paris Agreement comes into a picture five years ago. Just recently we celebrated fifth anniversary of Paris Agreement. There were many debates, discussions, how to reduce and mitigate climate change, but not much was, has been done. So this is the uh, event or case where we have to rem uh, remind ourselves of a famous quote by William Shakespeare to be or not to be here we can see how this application could work with the help of your mobile phone in your pocket this application is accessible to anyone in Mongolia and any place in the world for instance livestock products milk cashmere wool hides and skins all can be monitored of their origin and not only can be monitored by quality the health of these live products and producers the herders themselves can be monitored and all the information is measured and scored accordingly and here we come with this ball uh, which I showed to you how this pasture rehabilitation project linked with this football ball. Now, this ball has barcode on it. And with the, when you scan this barcode with your mobile phone application, it, it can give you actually the origin of this ball. It can give you this origin of this ball with all this data I showed to you where the height of this ball originated and who were the herders who had the cattle in their possession and in which location this cattle was uh, herding 
and then the quality of the hides and skins, etc. Even more, this ball could travel to all the way to Mars, I think. It could be one of the first football ball, balls in, on Mars. Because we can trace origins of this ball in Mongolia. And by this way, I want to tell when humankind lands on Mars, everything is landed on Mars from external world, could be traced and must be traced in order to not pollute Mars planet as we polluted our Mother Earth, Earth. So the application developed by Mongolians and researchers could be applied on Mars to trace everything which could be landed on Mars of their origin and trace traceability. And thank you for your attention. Mars and Earth International Digital Conference. Mars V. Digital transition and beyond. You know, technology is such an amazing thing. Using technology and implementing it into everyday life, humankind is progressing at a pace that is so fast. Absolutely. Progress is the key to moving forward. Space technologies are already developing uh, private sectors in so many ways, for instance, uh, remote sensing technologies and uh, in situ utilization projects are fundamentally changing the concept of mining. With that being said, individuals such as Gavin Galay is advocating that mining industry should focus on space. So let's focus our attention to the member of Rio Tinto and Chamber of American Commerce National Space Committee, Gavin Galay. Hi there, my name is Gavin from Rio Tinto in Queensland, Australia, and I really wish I could be there with you today, uh, but I'm excited to speak with you now. So a little bit about me, I work for a pseudo think tank within uh, Rio Tinto that looks at uh, the future beyond 2030. And uh, we look at everything from geopolitics to the latest in technologies, and we try and shape that world um, that worldview into some strategies that our company can use to be successful long into the future. So today uh, I'm here to speak to you a little bit about what I see in opportunities around the space industry and to give you some context on where I, I'm coming from there. I hold positions at Rio Tinto on the Remote Operated Vehicle Steering Committee and I uh, hold positions outside of Rio Tinto as an advisor for organisations such as the Australian Remote Operations in Space and Earth and also for the American Chamber of Commerce, New National Space Committee. I'm really pleased to be speaking with you today. I've got uh, some interesting topics in which to cover and I think they're very relevant to uh, what you're trying to achieve with your own programs there in Mongolia. So. Here we go. As part of this presentation, I'd like to speak to you about uh, an introduction to mining in space. And this goes for the moon, asteroids, or Mars, or even further out into the solar system, as it makes sense. But uh, starting with that, the most important things from a short-term perspective are that the space industry is probably the only place in which we're fundamentally challenging the way we view mining. They are coming at mining from a completely different angle uh, with completely new challenges and, and they need to invent uh, brand new processes, technologies and systems in which to uh, address those challenges. Uh, my role is to find those particular uh, solutions and see where they might benefit the mining industry that we have on Earth today. What interests me about the Artemis project is the potential for accelerating key technologies that will allow us to achieve a more specific, targeted, environmentally sustainable mining industry. An industry that has fundamentally remained unchanged for more than 100 years. 
and to understand why I think the space industry will be a catalyst for new mining, I'll share my baseline assumption with you now. If you take mining to its ultimate conclusion, regardless of time, cost or location, you're extracting the purest form possible of minerals, of resources, of specific elements in the environment and moving that into a location in which it can be easily utilised in the manufacturing of things. I like to imagine the future of mining looks something like termite mounds in a desert. Tiny machines going into the ground autonomously using advanced remote sensing to detect pure elements and bring them to the surface without disturbing the ground. No more giant pits and no huge machines. The purpose of getting highly specific is to do the least uh, possible or have the least possible impact on the environment while still providing the materials that we need that are essential for human progress. So to me, the future of mining looks very small, extremely specific, and I think the real advantage of this future might be the agnostic nature in which it's applied. If we get very small, then it might not matter if the resources are in the ground or in space. It may even be in many waste disposal pits near our cities or the way we dismantle old buildings. To thrive in space, we need to learn how to live off the land. And this is where Mongolia can play a key role in the future. The space industry calls this uh, in-situ resource utilization. The plan is to send autonomous machines ahead of people to find and extract resources and then build the structures required for human habitation. So we no longer need to bring everything from Earth to survive. The first iterations of this will likely be water on the moon to be used for propulsion and drinking. But in the future, entire structures could be 3D printed using the resources that are detected, mined and smelted into filament from a single or collection of small machines. The space industry might be the only place on Earth that has both the push and pull for completely different mining technologies. Uh, that aligns with a mining future reliant on specificity and our environmental ambitions here on Earth. Greater still is the disruption potential as these technologies are developed because whoever creates the agnostic system for mining off-world creates a system that would work anywhere in the solar system. And the risk is that new mining processes catch my industry off guard and become the uber to our taxi industry. And so this is something that's very important for me to keep across to maintain the health of our business. In many ways, the mining industry is the perfect partner for the exploration of resources elsewhere in the solar system. With deep levels of all body knowledge gained from hundreds of years of experience, the mining industry possesses a business culture for risk tolerance that is comfortable investing billions in capital on opportunities that may not recover investment for decades to come. However, to invest that capital and accept the inherent risk, the mining industry applies very stringent demands on the level of surety for investment. It takes many years for mining companies to identify appropriate resources and more years still to quantify the opportunity to a level in which we can invest. As of today, the space industry can't provide the detailed information a mining company would need to invest in space resource extraction. And mining companies are very comfortable with the low competition that we have here on Earth right now. The burning platform required to have large mining companies such as Rio Tinto looking at more extreme opportunities to ensure our survival doesn't yet exist. So while I'm excited about the opportunities I'm going to outline the barriers to entry for the foreseeable future and some opportunities my industry can start working on today to ensure it's ready to explore ISIU opportunities in the future. Some of the barriers of entries as I see them over the next 10 years are the detailed information mining companies need to invest in space resource extraction is not yet available. We rely heavily on incredibly advanced remote sensing technologies, satellite-based target acquisition uh, technologies, and then to be able to go and check on the ground physically to confirm what those targets uh, indicate might be there. 
The second piece is really important to us that doesn't yet exist, is the customer a mining company would be supplying is not well understood. These are uncommon partners our industry has little or no experience working with. And the dollars uh, required and the volume of resources required and the type of resources required has, has not yet fully been articulated. The value of the resources to a customer is also arbitrary and untested at this moment. And that's going to be a critical component that will determine when and where the mining industry can uh, invest uh, in in-situ resource utilisation projects. There is a couple of early indicators of uh, cost and volume, but uh, until the space industry itself accurately defines what they're going to need and where they're going to need it, uh, it's going to be difficult for us in the mining industry to understand how we could supply those needs. The last consideration is that the, the, the space industry from a mining perspective doesn't make a lot of sense to our current business model. Today's mining companies are volume businesses and the space industry doesn't yet need the volume of resources that would attract a mining company with the necessary capital to invest. If we take the assumption that we have 100 people living on the moon today, it's not likely that they would need any more than a million tonnes of resources per year, regardless of what those resources would be. And the challenge for us as an industry in getting our minds around uh, what we could do and how we could participate is that our smallest mines produce tens of millions of tonnes of resources. The value in off-world mining opportunities from a demand perspective is less than the value of a few large mining trucks, but requires the equivalent capital investment of building two or three new mines. The cost benefit ratio is decades or a major technology step uh, away from being a reality. However, there's some really exciting opportunities in which we can explore together with space industry partners. We can also partner on the research and uh, development of new agnostic methods of ISIU in remote sensing, extraction, processing, benefication and refining to turn exploitable materials into refined resources for 3D printing or engineered materials. The space industry has expertise in high efficiency, low energy structures in hostile environments. A partnership between the mining and space and construction industries to provide a step change in the physical assets used in the exploration, sorry, in the exploitation of resources, would help solve uh, many of our scope one, two, and three emission concerns. Uh, so we can be better partners with the environment, the communities in which we work. The value of data is increasingly important as a competitive advantage in the mining industry. A partnership that leverages the space industry's expertise in high-speed, low-latency communication, remote sensing and satellite constellations in exchange for expertise in exploration and mining industry could be a critical partnership opportunity for both parties. Co-development of small machines that combine exploration with extraction and refining with a focus on high specificity could add significant advantages to both on and off-world ISIU. The majority of what mining companies do is move waste material, even after processing and refining a product like iron ore is only 60%, which means every ship is transporting 40% of its volume as waste. The ultimate goal needs to be to extract exactly what is needed and nothing more. And in this context, Mongolia is incredibly well placed in which to be a test bed for new technologies that are both relevant to the mining industry of today and the space industry of tomorrow. And so I'm very proud to partner with the Mars 5 team in order to explore those opportunities together. And so in conclusion, I'd say the pace of innovation is accelerating and in situ resource utilization will be a reality far sooner than most people realize. And the question for me is, will we build those uncommon partnerships with the space industry or will the space industry 
create an agnostic mining system that will swallow up the old guard, such as Rio Tinto. So it's fantastic to have the opportunity to speak with you today, and I would love to uh, go into more detail about the opportunities that I see where the space industry and the common resource industries can effectively partner for mutual benefit. I hope you uh, enjoyed that uh, brief sort of outline of, of my views of some of the opportunities. Have a great event. Uh, hello from Australia. And I will talk to you again soon. Definitely enjoyable. And you know, a lot of our private sectors can also in the future potentially shift towards space. Space industry is a not new topic in Mongolia and we have abundant history in the space industry. Definitely. Mongolia is deeply rooted in the histories of aerospace research. We have an astronaut who's been to space and with that from 1960s and on Mongolia has participated in international legislation of space law itself. Not only Mongolia, since 2000 many countries have been using information technology as a trigger to develop society. Therefore, we are going to invite Ms. Bolaritn Batsingal, Chairwoman of Communication and Information Technology Authority of Mongolia. Mars and Earth International Digital Conference. Mars V. Hello everyone. So I will be talking about space policies and digital transformation of Mongolia. So during my presentation, um, we will, I will walk you through several things. The first one is um, Mongolia's space activities. Second one is digital transformation in Mongolia. And in the end of my presentation, I will be walking you to the further activities that the government of Mongolia is planning in the next few years. So Mongolia's space intervention really started in 1965, where Mongolia joined the program called Intercosmos. Intercosmos was a Soviet space development program which brought all the space-related um, uh, programs and experts and uh, professionals together in the uh, 1965. So in the 1970s, um, we started receiving satellite data from the station orbit, and 1981 was rather historical year for Mongolia because Mr. Gurarcha, the first astronaut of Mongolia and second astronaut of Asia to, uh, to travel to the space. So uh, we still worship very much this year. Next, um, in the 1990s, um, satellite activities became our main, main um, priorities in the communication. So we really started looking into it, starting to develop policies. 1998, VSAT program was, VSAT system was introduced. Um, 2006, APSCOS training, uh, MASTA and DOCSTA program started and Mongolia joined this program. So MASTA means master's program and DOCSA means doctor's program. And we start to send our experts and young people to educated in this field. 2012, the government of Mongolia approved the national satellite project. Um, 2013, national concert co competition starts to get organized every year. 2018, um, uh, communication and information technology, which I'm representing today, we signed a um, memo with um, Center National Youths of French Republic. And last year, 2019, we signed an agreement between the government of Mongolia and government of Republic India on space development. So here we are. Um, also, I would like to show you some of the international cooperations that we have been um, doing with uh, various international organizations. Um, so w the government of Mongolia is planning several activities regarding space development. The first one is 
to pass national space legislation in Mongolia. As I mentioned, we joined many international agreements. Um, second one is threatening international cooperation and human resource capacity. So as I emphasized before, uh, Mongolia has had very good uh, cooperation with other international organizations. So in the next few years, what we will be focusing on is um, educating our young people in space field and collaborating, cooperating regarding human resource. The third one is support public-private partnership in this field, of course. Um, so also we would like to ask for other organizations to join in um, for developing the um, space field, space development. So um, private organizations and NGOs will be the heart of space activities in Mongolia. Today we have about 200 um, space-related entities and I have to say that Marsfi is one of the biggest projects that we have had so far. Um, the innovation and entrepreneurship initiative in the space field, the government will be supporting these initiatives and B2B model in the space activities. Also, regarding citizens, citizens will become digital citizens and learn more about space exploration. So I think this is very, very exciting um, thing for our citizens and especially young people. Thank you so much for your attention. Mongolia and space activities are intertwined. So, in this sense, we have to keep on this effort. The world is aiming towards space for the sake of sustainability and the improvement of all humankind. And with that, we have founder and CEO of Helium 3 Power and the member of the Norway Space Agency, Janneke Mikkelsen. Hello everyone, hello Mars A and hello Mars V. It is a pleasure to be invited to speak at your groundbreaking Mars on Earth virtual conference, an event of great international importance. Mongolians have always been at the forefront of space exploration. Back in 1967, two years before 11, Apollo 11 launched and Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were the first humans to walk on the moon, Mongolia signed the Outer Space Treaty. The most important paragraph of the Outer Space Treaty defines that all nations shall carry out activities in the exploration and use of outer space in the interest of maintaining international peace and promoting international cooperation and understanding. Mongolians are now in a unique position to lead the way for nations to achieve international cooperation in United Space Exploration. Project Mars A and Mars V will bring the world together and unite us towards one goal, to achieve human spaceflight to a neighboring planet, Mars. In order to achieve our united goal, every nation must look at their traditional industry sector and understand how their nation's expertise can be transferred directly to the advancement of deep space operations. The discovery of planetary resources to benefit life on Earth, will be of the utmost importance to the advancement of hu the human race. Natural extraterrestrial resources will be paramount to humanity's technological advancement to allow all humans on Earth the basic right to access electricity. Only once we have given every human on Earth access to clean and efficient energy can we advance our global civilization. The elements that we need to achieve this clean energy on Earth will come from our cosmic universe. Knowledge and expertise of how to work in extreme hazardous environments will be of great value in our quest to mine natural resources on other planets to better life back here on Earth. Mongolia just happens to be one of the nations that are, na that are mining experts. Each individual person, woman and man, who previously thought they were far removed from the space program is now the most sought after people in the advancement of the emerging deep space industry. Endurance will also be the most sought after strength in her quest to reach Mars. Establishing a base on Mars will not be an easy feat. If the moon was a giant leap of, for mankind, Mars will be the gigantic leap for mankind. 
you must be a determined people who understand the reward of showing extreme endurance. The people of the world learn, could learn a thing or two from the Mongolian people. We are looking at achieving humanity's next giant leap to Mars within the next decade. We must come together in peaceful cooperation for the good of our planet and for the future of mankind. Through the Outer Space Treaty, we have pledged an oath to always work together as brother and sister. Even work peacefully together through political differences, international tension and war. We have pledged to unite through science and advance humans to become a multi-planetary species, no matter what our differences should be. We are no longer individual nations. We all have a responsibility to participate a nation's expertise to accelerate the international space program together. Here is where Mars V and Mars A is of extreme importance to our global collaboration and global economy. The Gobi Desert of Mongolia will become a place of international peaceful cooperation amongst nations, an area of the world where we can work together and learn from each other to achieve future operational spaceflight to Mars and back to Earth. We will share knowledge and we will be inspired by each other. We will also advance trade amongst space nations. This is why I started my Norwegian company Helium-3 Power to accelerate international efforts to bring back from the moon the valuable natural resource Helium-3, a resource which, which does not exist on Earth. The Helium-3 will be an important step in our technological advancement towards achieving clean fusion energy on Earth. We need to provide clean energy to the world with absolute zero carbon emission and zero radioactive waste. Like Mongolia, Norway is not a traditional space nation. However, both our landscapes can be equally as hazardous to endure by our people. And through generations, we have managed to endure and innovate how we use our natural resources. Norway just happens to have a natural resource of flake graphite that can innovate space materials by making them stronger and lighter through non-polluting manufacturing methods. Norway's in-depth knowledge in mining for this natural resource will transform the future of space exploration to the moon and beyond. Like Norway, Mongolia also has tremendous access to natural resources, and I urge you to look at your tr traditional uh, mining sector to transfer your earthbound industry to explore planetary mining and hazardous environment logistics, which Mongolia, of course, are experts in. In the future, I predict we will start to use cosmic extraterrestrial resources like our moon, Mars, and asteroids to stop depleting our planet of valuable resources. We need these resources to advance materials for space exploration, and we need these materials to improve life on Earth. People have always dreamed of what it would be like to live on Mars. Now we have the technology and we have the expertise to go. Let's bring our nations together around the uh, let's bring our nations together around the globe and unite ourselves and establish a human settlement on Mars. Thank you so much. Well, as Janneke just mentioned again and again, cooperation in space activity has to be key. And revolution, industrial revolution, especially the fourth age of industrial revolution, is here and happening right now, which is opening gateways to the future. There are also concept of digital transformation caused by fourth industrial revolution. Therefore, we are going to invite Mr. Jarosehan Dor, CEO of Young Research Supporting Foundation in Mongolia. So what is revolution? Well, there is no person, no family, no organization who are left without being affected by the fourth industrial revolution and digital transformation. So revolution is a, a change. And surprisingly, we learned that uh, there, there are no commonly shared definition for both of them, what is revolution and what is change. And uh, as our foundation provides uh, support toward young researchers in a better understanding and using systemized cognitive skills through training and uh, 
guided research, we have managed to develop our own version of definitions of, of the above uh, such concepts like revolution and the change. Let's try to deal with these concepts of the revolution. Uh, changing uh, belief and paradigms is excessively hard and time consuming uh, process. And that's why we don't face a revolution every day. And mistakenly, many of us tend to, thi uh, to, to think and to equal the concept of a revolution to the concept of a kind of a rebellion or uh, violence. Uh, and but uh, when we have a uh, deeper look into the nature of the concept of uh, revolution, uh, uh, this look will tell us uh, uh, what is the root causes of those violent actions are changes of the old paradigms that use it to serve as the foundation for sustaining stability. And the severe environment to force that humans to make inventions that would enable them to survive and knowledge will remain to be the main and the only tool to address countless challenges faced by humankind. Knowledge is the main driving force for understanding the root causes of many problems and inventing solutions. And through building knowledge, which is known as the, the cognitive process, is extremely complex process. And we know that there are two key ingredients for thinking. The first, data, and the uh, second is thinking style. Of course, uh, many suggest that uh, industrial revolutions are uh, different from political revolutions. But again, let's have a deeper look uh, and uh, we will see the same thing that is change in our mindset. And there are uh, three main changes that, uh, that are driving the fourth industrial revolution. The first, humankind enjoyed unprecedented capacity of uh, uh, data generation. And uh, 2040 uh, study suggests that the, we, we humans generate the huge volume of data in two days in 2014, which is equal to all combined data that has been generated by humankind during 11,000 to 2,000. Uh, even I may even today suggest that uh, it would take only two hours into 2020. At the same time, data has become the most valuable commodity, leaving be behind the oil, oil and other commodities. And the second, the computing power. Today we witness not only exponentially increased computing power, but also inclusive and affordable computing powers. And the thirdly, the connectivity, connect, connectedness. Thanks to tremendously increased connectedness, now we are able to share knowledge at unprecedented magnitude and speed. So the ultimate benefits that are provided by the fourth uh, industrial revolution is the increased capacity, capability of generating knowledge. Uh, technology is knowledge. And technology is not something that uh, uh, uh, separate from knowledge. Technology is knowledge. And that is invented by thinking. And it helps in easing and making, making more comfortable, uh, com comfortable certain parts of our life. Its, in, in, its entry into our daily life is limitless. And we are becoming so dependent on this uh, knowledge that is named technology. The fourth industrial revolution give a birth to countless new disruptive technologies. And we should expect to enjoy even more new technologies that would be more efficient and more affordable and more inclusive and more cheaper. So there are many uh, definitions of the concept of digital transformations. And there are many studies suggesting that the most attempts to realize the digital transformation fail. And it's very important that we understand what is digital transformation and what is the necessity of that is causing digital transformation. And digital transformation is a logical consequence that is caused by the fourth industrial revolution. 
And also, digital transformation is also an opportunity. To me, digital transformation is not the ultimate goal. It is a process of transformation enabling to build knowledge in timely and accurate manner. Many of us mistakenly tend to think that knowledge building is very complex and a costly process. In reality, knowledge doesn't have to be rocket science. It can be in the form of inventing very simple solutions that would allow uh, you to save few seconds or few cents in performance of simple moves or actions. Those few seconds and cents can make huge difference when it accumulates as a result of repetitive moves and actions. Unfortunately, many companies and organizations simply ignore uh, those seemingly modest savings that could eventually create huge value for all the stakeholders. And let's take a, have a look at the Sears. Once that used to be the biggest uh, retail chain in the US and uh, to compare with the Amazon. And you can see the clear difference the, uh, the, between companies that has employed the digital transformation and that failed to employ digital transformation. Digital transformation is not option, it's necessity. As the customer's behavior and their expectations are changing so fast, the companies must change it no less than the customer changes their, their speed. And disruptive technologies dealing with the data generating, processing and uh, transmitting are helpful in building knowledge. But that's not enough for building good quality knowledge. The, the missing part is our thinking style. The lack of aligned mental model between stakeholders is very failing part. A mental model is a final product of thinking and the content and the form of such model vary greatly. It's a natural process, but it can be also lead to disaster consequences in many cases. And systemized thinking is the, the most promising alternative that can help us in improving our thinking skills and creating commonly shared goal. If we fail to change our thinking style, which is the ultimate root causes of many problems that we face today, and dis disruptive technologies won't help us. In many cases, those technologies will cause chain reaction that will cause me more complicated problems. Systemized thinking can't be achieved instantly and uh, possessing such thinking skills really require dedication of time and other resources. Thinking can be systemized. The biggest obstacle preventing us from making our thinking more disciplined and more systemized are our persistent paradigms and the lack of skills of applying any interdisciplinary approach to, uh, to make our thinking more disciplined. A person needs to acquire all, uh, at least the basic knowledge about the system engineering and logics and psychology and their interrelation in order to make thinking more disciplined. We have developed and tested so-called systemized cognitive technology and data, uh, and data generated by testing suggests it's very encouraging. And the last year we conducted a brief research aimed at learning about the differences between prevailing mindset of Mongols uh, as a nomads and the systemized, uh, systemized thinking. And the finding surprised us. As we see here, there is a tremendous potential of making our thinking not only disciplined uh, uh, and uh, systemized, but also creative ones. And the fourth industrial revolution brought so many challenges as well. And one of the biggest challenges, our mindset dominated by legacy paradigms. And it's clear to me that our thinking style 
which has brought so many wonderful innovations and progress to us, needs to be changed in order to stay able to digest and to handle properly huge data and generate the much needed knowledge. Thank you. Mars and Earth International Digital Conference, Mars V. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for being with us. This is the last panel discussion of our conference. We just got very interesting speeches about uh, space mining, the fourth industrial revolution, digital transformation, and Mongolia's activity and policy in the information technology sector. Now, we invite some distinguished guests to discuss how we can make remarkable contribution to the space industry and what solutions we can offer. Please welcome His Excellency, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary of India to Mongolia, Mr. Mohinder Pratap Singh. And His Excellency, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary of United States of America to Mongolia, Mr. Michael Klachewski. And Mr. Patnerent Lothunshar, the Vice Minister of Mining and heavy industry, and Mr. Ranzorik Ulzibair, economist and the chairman of board of directors at Mandl Insurance. 75% uh, of foreign direct investment in Mongolia was addressed to the mining sector in the last year. But now here we are talking about supporting new sector, namely space technology and innovation. So how can you see the benefit of supporting space-related technology and innovation. On top of its very interesting geography, Mongolia has, an, has a very high temperature uh, differentiation between the night and the day, and also it's one of the coldest places on the earth and the, one of the most dry places on the earth. So I think to mimic uh, uh, uh, alien pla planet environment to test the equipment and to test the uh, the human suitability is I think Mongolia suits very well. Also Mongolia of course is an oasis of democracy mm -hmm. as many uh, prominent global politicians call it. So we have a very supporting legal and economical infrastructure to develop, uh, uh, to develop a space research. And even that can further be developed into space tourism. Mm -hmm. You know, not, not everyone can or even want to go to space, but everyone wants to go to a place on the earth that mimics a space itself, right? So I think it could be the location and we have this mindset, I think, which is very, uh, very, very outstanding. Uh, you highlighted the advantages and capacities of Mongolia. But there are many people may wonder that how a country of only 3.5 million people can carry out the giant project like Mars V. So what will answer, how will you answer this question? Because you wrote, you launched a very successful book, Psychology of Management. So based on your managemental psychology, how would you answer that question? Well, I think uh, yesterday's giant project is today's common project, you know. So I think giant is really in our psychology, it's our perception. It's not really a giant project because, you know, we can support it. As long as we have the right environment mm -hmm. from geographic perspective and from uh, legal and human capacity perspective in order to support such a project. So I think it's a, it's a very, very suitable but often overlooked place that is Mongolia. In our Mars 3 project, we also talk a lot about um, survival skill and adaptive skill of Mongolians. So what is a special um, expertise for nomadic people and what is their advantage and specialty? I believe it's very interesting mix and your question addresses that challenge spot on. Because Mongolia is a perfect place. Why? 
to discover and to colonize, to make a home, an alien planet, you have those specific behaviors and specific adaptable capacities, psychologically prepared mm -hmm. as an astronaut, as a colonist. Mm -hmm. So in the world, there's no culture that can mimic that the best and that is the nomadic culture. We Mongolians, as nomadics, we always adapt to some of the harshest climates on the earth. And we truly adapt to what nature demands us to be. And that really comes from this mindset, mindset of being flexible and be prepared to any challenge and become a strategist. But unfortunately, in our today's, uh, in today's uh, typical Western style education system, we don't teach complexity. But in this education system, everything is linear. Everything's so simple, like A plus B equals C. But life is not like that. Life is complex. And nature is not like that. Nature is complex. And if we talk about alien planet, it's even to the next degree of complexity we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So if you put a nomadic herder from Mongolia and put him in a rocket and send him to a Mars, I believe he will be the best suited you know, astronaut mm -hmm. to colonize Mars, in fact, mm -hmm. because he's got these right mindsets. Because to adapt, to be flexible, to become a strategist is what he is used to from very younger, young ages. Mm -hmm. So I think Mongolian Gobi Desert and combined with uh, witnessing the nomadic lifestyle can be an excellent psychological training ground for those future astronauts who are opting to fly the next rocket to the, to the Mars. Ladies and gentlemen, Happy New Year again. I'm excited to start the last panel discussion of our conference. And it is a great honor to have His Excellency, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary of India to Mongolia, Mr. M.P. Singh. Thank you. So first question um, from you is one of our key speakers of this conference, Ms. Yannick from Norway. Uh, she mentioned that both Norway and Mongolia are not traditional space nations, but we have a big ambition in the space industry. So therefore, why and how those countries which are not familiar with the space industry contribute to the space exploration, in your opinion? Uh, your question has two elements. Mm. Uh, the smaller countries that don't have the space capabilities and then why and how. I'll just give you why. Uh, if you look at the history of the world uh, industrial production, there have been four revolutions. The first revolution was water and steam which mechanized the production. And second uh, came uh, the electric, which made mass scale production possible. And the third revolution, which is electronics and IT, which digitized the production levels. And the fourth revolution, which is building on the third revolution, uh, is digitizing the production of the world. Now, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a country which is, uh, which, is, which is smaller like Mongolia, but has inherent strength, you have very strong uh, uh, mining and mineral resources, you have rare earth elements, you have a vast nation with a scarce population. Uh, so we uh, need to make use of this because sooner the whole of uh, uh, production systems will be moving digitally. It has gone from automated to digital and very soon it will move, uh, the controls at least, will move from the terrestrial into the extraterrestrial space. Mm. Uh, so for a country like smaller country like Mongolia, they would need to, uh, that was the why, and second is that they need to collaborate. They need to have exchange, uh, information exchange, sharing mechanism. They could sign MOUs, uh, uh, they, could, they could have training for many of the young people here. 
and have an institutional linkage uh, and uh, with with with the nations that have uh, that have stronger capabilities and as you know india is uh, uh, now one of the top four nations in space area we started this uh, several years ago but we very much feel uh, that uh, we could uh, we could we could support uh, upcoming nations with mongolia we have a strategic partnership last year in september we signed uh, an agreement on cooperation in space uh, during which many of uh, your team members also accompanied the president batulga so i'm sure that within the framework of that we could uh, develop the how uh, part of uh, developing the mongolian space program so india is one of the leading country in space technology um, so therefore my question is in your opinion how what was the main trigger what was the main catalyst that led to india's leap in technological advancement yeah but it's uh, true in, in 1962 uh, when the nation was just a nascent nation uh, uh, the, the program was started and uh, by the time ISRO, that is Indian Space Research Organization, became an independent arm, that was in 1969, and going forward, within uh, six years of its, uh, its, its, its, its formation, it was able to launch first satellite in 1975, which is Arevata, named after the famous Indian astronomist. Of course, much of, uh, uh, much of our space development program was indigenous, but there was a great support from the then Soviet Union. And I was uh, answering to your first question uh, as to how do we move forward. So the vision of uh, the father of Indian space industry, uh, Dr. Vikram Sharabhai, uh, who was uh, the father of the space uh, research, he put forth a plan which was neither uh, looking at uh, glorification of a space. And I would say unlike other uh, countries, uh, uh, the idea was not the prestige, but the problem solving. Idea was how to use the application of technology for solving the real life problem. And uh, the whole idea was to use the resources, but not go into the race. The whole idea was to make uh, technology development oriented rather than, you know, a race with any other nation. And uh, it started off in a modest level mm -hmm. and uh, over a period of time, you know uh, that uh, just last month, which is uh, uh, November 6th, India launched another uh, uh, satellite and with it, it launched a number of uh, smaller satellites for various nations. To allow you a perspective as to how Indian space industry grew, uh, from 1975 till about 2019, India has put into space uh, uh, more than more than more than 350 satellites already and uh, India also shares three world records incidentally which may not be known to many uh, the number one was of course the, the, the moon mission where the water was discovered and second one uh, uh, when India landed uh, Indian uh, uh, space uh, craft landed on red planet Mars in the very first attempt the first nation in Asia and you know, the fourth nation in the world to do so. And uh, the third uh, world record was India launched uh, a few years back uh, 104 satellites in one go in the space. Most of it were foreign satellites, beating the record of uh, Russia, which launched 37. So uh, this was one perspective as to how a nation made use of space for, for, for various uh, requirements. And as I mentioned to you, and you had asked me a question, uh, I think there's a lot which we can do with, uh, with Mongolia. Uh, Mongolia has a large uh, geographical area, smaller population. So the, our desire to move space moved by, uh, not as I said, glory, but by the needs. So need to exploit uh, the natural resources, need to expand the education, need to uh, revolutionize the communication, telecast, telemedicine, disaster management, weather mapping. And all of this has helped India uh, consolidate its strengths and uh, made it able uh, to utilize its natural resources much better way. And uh, I'm pretty sure uh, that uh, uh, we, as, uh, as in India, in the Indian Space Research Organization, 
uh, last year some of you uh, had visited them have seen the capabilities firsthand your president expressed appreciation as to uh, the achievements of ISRO, we would be very happy to go forward. So to say uh, what triggered, the trigger was uh, the need to, uh, need to have a development as a focus using space area. And going forward, the whole idea is to consolidate our synergies in next, uh, next uh, about uh, five years, we have planned about eight more missions, which includes uh, one manned mission to the moon and also to the Mars. Government support is very also important in the sector, very right? Very crucial, very crucial. What made the Indian uh, space uh, uh, a success story was the governmental backing. Mm -hmm. Back then, from 1962, coming now, there have been a consistent uh, government support. And once the government support is there, uh, and uh, there is uh, a dedicated number of people who collaborated, as I told you, uh, learnt a lot uh, and exchanged a lot of information with the then Soviet Union and now we have our own program where we are collaborating with over 60 nations in the world helping them develop and consolidate their synergies mm -hmm. and uh, just to give you an example uh, I'm not sure whether many of your uh, people would have noticed NASA has uh, an annual budget of about 22.6 billion Chinese Space Agency has a budget of about 11 billion a year. Uh, European Space Agency has a budget of about 7.5, 7.4 billion a year. And now contrast this with ISRO, which operates on a budget of just 1.2 billion and making all of these missions possible and also supporting the other uh, nations with, with, with whom we have uh, entered into the partnership. So yes, governmental support is very crucial. But more than that, uh, there is an imperative need to draw up a plan. And as I, yeah. as I mentioned in my remarks that, you know, in six years, if India could put uh, its first satellite in space, uh, certainly in today's age and time where the information is uh, so much available and resources are uh, uh, easily uh, exploitable, I'm pretty sure uh, that uh, we could synergize uh, uh, our, uh, our efforts and try and support uh, Mongolia uh, within the framework of the space agreement that was signed last year and help them make, uh, make, make uh, further progress in the mission. So you say that exact government support plan, exact plan is important. Sure. Yeah, I think, um, so if everyone, if the maybe whole nation understand what is their nation's vision and mission, the youths probably may be more productive and they will believe in their future more. And that was another trigger maybe. Mongolia is the 18th largest nation on this earth. With a population of just 3.3 uh, million people, uh, there is vast number of natural resources, primarily mining, uh, rare earth and others. And, uh, you know, a country as big as this, uh, how do you uh, map your own resources? Mining is the mainstay of Mongolian economy. Mm. But yet the whole of mapping, not only of uh, of, of those currently, the three C's, copper, coal and Kashmir are the mainstay. But I would say going forward, uh, if you look at uh, the rare earth elements, which is, which is, which is the mainstay of uh, today's uh, electronics production and uh, in the digital area, uh, this could be of a great help. Uh, it could help herders, uh, let's say, uh, the mobility uh, between one region to another or predicting Zud or uh, disaster management. Uh, many of those areas can be easily, uh, easily, easily used through space technologies. And uh, it is not necessary that you have to have your own satellite. Mm. You could also have a leased satellite and you can also launch a small satellite. As I said, ISRO has a commercial arm which is called Anthrix. And uh, they have been launching uh, foreign satellites and I told you so many and they hold the world record and pretty much uh, sure we are in discussions uh, with Mongolia already. I have no problem in sharing as to, as to whether we could explore the possibility of launching the communication satellite for Mongolia. Mongolia is uh, first and the only satellite muzzle alive. Mm -hmm. I think decommissioned last year if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. So certainly I think going forward if there is a support from the government side and uh, the youth uh, which is uh, uh, which is which is a very integral element uh, and uh, 
some some passionate people I have seen in this room uh, and beyond, uh, they could uh, evolve a certain plan. And you mentioned about the Mars uh, on Earth project, which I remember. And uh, this could be a tourism uh, area, a potential area. You see, the only other country that I know is uh, looking at this is is uh, is UAE, and. Uh, and with such a wonderful terrain that Mongolia has in Gobi Desert, this yeah. could be one area which could be developed. So I'm not saying it's only one aspect mm. of the economy that will get supported. It will be tourism, it will be weather prediction, it could be communication. And it's such a vast country, education, telemedicine, all of these uh, can, be, can be used better using the space technology. Thank you for coming in here. No, it is such a and pleasure. Are, yeah. and, uh, I thank you on the contrary for inviting me to, to such a prestigious conference. We were looking in the physical format, but yes, as they digital is the new word and uh, I appreciate. And uh, as far as I can say that uh, we again reiterate our commitment to our strategic partner Mongolia to help them develop their space program. And through Mars, we will be happy to support this with this lower and this. Thank you. Thank you. Wish you a very bright and unique, productive year. Thank you. Namaste. So my next question is for Mr. Batnerendo. One of our key speakers, Ms. Janneke from Norway, mentioned in her speech that every nation must look at their traditional industry sector and understand how their national expertise can be transferred directly to the advancement of space-related operations. So in Mongolian case, Mongolia's economy is heavily tied to the mining industry. Mm -hmm. So how can we redirect revenues raised by mining sector into the innovation and technology, mm -hmm. thereby diversifying Mongolia's portfolio? Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the Mongolia's economy, uh, it's actually very simple. Mm -hmm. And 90% of our revenue uh, generated from just a few key mining products copper, gold, coal, iron ore. And, um, and our challenge is how, how can we direct those revenue generated from the uh, mining sector into um, other key industries um, where, where we have competitive advantage or where we have a future potential. And uh, at the government level, we're looking at um, uh, to build to establish a sovereign development fund uh, where basically we can collect extra revenues generated from our mining sector and, and, and the channel that um, fund generated from the mining sector into uh, other sectors like uh, where we, you know, we believe that we have competitive advantage or where science and technology can actually make a difference. And um, so, I mean, if you look at the uh, other countries, there are more than 120 uh, sovereign, so-called sovereign wealth funds, mm -hmm. where, where a lot of resource-rich countries actually uh, are able to collect their mining revenue, channel into, you know, non-mining, and be able to grow their non-mining sectors. And and um, there there is a kind of, I guess, increasingly uh, increasing tendency towards. Um, specifically building sovereign development fund, not the wealth fund. Mm -hmm. and, and that's applicable especially for uh, developing uh, countries where uh, you know, big investment are necessary to develop infrastructure or, or, or, um, or start uh, you know, our new industries where technological advancement and innovation can be used. So my next question from Mr. Batnerendal mm -hmm. is, what is Mongolia's long-term industrial capacity and strategic plan? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so the government uh, has put together Mongolia's long-term uh, national strategic plan, so-called Vision 2050. So where basically uh, we defined uh, and made it official, okay, what industries uh, are uh, preferred or where we have you know, most potential and uh, like apart mining, right? So that includes, for example, agriculture, uh, tourism. And one of them is actually, I think most interesting to me is uh, 
we called it creative industry, uh, where you know startups and um, uh, non-traditional um, small medium enterprises can actually develop and and and become the next billion dollar industry. And uh, I think that's where basically we need to sort of think outside the box and outside the economic traditional economic uh, model. And then I think that's where um, we sort of have to challenge, uh, or even if you look at the, you know, the, where we, uh, what the world has accomplished in the last 30 years using technological advancement and innovation is really uh, sort of pushing, uh, pushing the traditional model where every country or a country has to focus on uh, industries where they have the biggest competitive advantage. Let's say, like look at Mongolia, for example, right? So we have a big land, a, a lot of uh, animals, livestock. So that means we have to focus on agriculture or we have uh, a lot of natural resources. So that means we have to focus on mining. But the, what about the industries where the technology or innovation can enable uh, enable to actually build the next billion dollar industry. And then I think that's what we see uh, in many, uh, many countries. Uh, you know, the, it's almost like um, we see a lot of mushrooms after the rain. You know, there are a lot of you know, billion dollar worth or billion dollar valued uh, unicorns around the world uh, in so many different industries. So they were able to do so using technolo technology and innovation and really bringing uh, existing or new products and services for for hundreds of millions of people or billions of people who are not considered um, uh, be able to afford otherwise so-called non-consumers mm. and then I think that's where so there's an interesting concept um, so-called uh, market creating innovation mm. and that's actually that's where I would like to focus I think when we look at innovation, when we talk about innovation and technological advancement, right, um, we can actually dive uh, deeper into, okay, what really innovation is? Why innovation actually matters for countries like Mongolia, for example? Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, uh, the innovation, the type of innovation that matters the most for us is market creating innovation. What that means is that it, it's the type of innovation um, that can make products and services that were so expensive for majority of the population only accessible for uh, you know few people and how can you bring those products and services accessible to to the the, the rest of the country rest of the population who cannot access and afford otherwise and that's market creating innovation that's actually probably the most in important innovation um, that can actually change uh, probably the entire industry or the face of many developing countries. And then I think we can actually apply that concept for ex when it comes to, for example, the Project Mars mm. V. Um, and then probably as a young person, I believe that next billion dollar idea is probably in the minds of young people in Mongolia. We might not be able to see it, and that's why we can't say that's the industry we should focus on. That's the next billion dollar industry where we have the biggest competitive advantage. But that traditional model has been challenged. And with, with what, that means is, what that means is that we need really to think outside the box and um, invest or support those young people who might be carrying the billion dollar idea in their head. Mm -hmm. And how can we enable those young people to actually solve the problems that we face in Mongolia, for example. What about air pollution, right? What about the challenges? What about um, bringing that you know, extra income into like, different industries? How can we grow th the industries that we might not, we actually, we might not be even aware? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the challenge, but at the same time, I think that's where the wealth or that's, the, that's where the opportunity lies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As you just mentioned about market, creating innovation mm. and seems like many of us just focus on the concept of innovation but mm. not really talk about the types of innovation mm. yeah and i never heard of the market creating innovation so mm. thank you for giving a new knowledge to all of us so my last question will be same for all of the panelists 
So the question yeah. is, how can we transform Mongolia's mining-based development model mm -hmm. into technology-based growth policy? And what will be the benefit or importance of developing a technology-based economy? Mm -hmm. um, I think today Mongolia is heavily, as you said, uh, dependent on mining resources. Mm -hmm. And that's where a quarter of our state budget comes from. That's where 90% of the export come from. And uh, how can we bring that uh, wealth generated from one specific industry into uh, industries where we have most potential? And, um, and, and for, to me, policy-wise, the key is really to focus on, uh, I think one of the keys is to, uh, to build, to actually to establish that sovereign development fund. And I see that as a sort of mechanism to bring, you know, to channel the uh, re mining generated income into, into other industries. For, you know, what about science and technology? What about, you know, startups and the, that are trying to solve the next, uh, trying to solve like the problems or the challenges as a country we face? Mm -hmm. And um, for example, two thirds of our uh, residents in, in our capital city live in their district, right? Mm -hmm. um, there are many challenges that we need to solve. And I think the solutions are in the mind of uh, young people. And, and that sovereign development fund that we aiming to build actually can enable uh, that mechanism flowing, you know, the revenue generated from mining into um, other, you know, uh, other industries where we can use that market creating innovation and technological advancement to enable uh, products and services that are not accessible to majority of the population. Welcome back everyone. I'm pleased to welcome very honorary guest today. So please welcome His Excellency Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary of America or U.S. Uh, to Mongolia, Mr. Michael Kleczynski. Greetings. So, thank you for receiving our invitation. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Okay. Uh, so I have uh, several questions Please, on you. Please, sure. <clears throat> so first question is, now uh, U.S., uh, NASA and SpaceX are attempting to make a crewed mission to Mars around 2030s, only maybe within 10 years later. So. How do you see this mission? What is your opinion about that? Oh, first of all, I find it incredibly exciting. And one of the things that uh, is happening right now, which maybe you might say adds to the excitement, is that the preparations mm -hmm. yeah. are moving along really well. So for instance, you know, now we have a, a mission to, to the moon. Of course, it's focused on the moon, but in so doing, it also kind of lays the groundwork, prepares for uh, uh, some of the aspects of, uh, of being on Mars. So that's one way of preparing. Um, and meanwhile, soon, in fact, we're going to have a, uh, a rover on, uh, on Mars. It's on its way, as they say. In fact, I think it's really amazing that NASA has a website, because I looked it up, uh, that tells you exactly how many days, hours, and even minutes until landing. So it's, uh, it's been very... Um, uh, exciting from the point of view even of the way NASA presents it to the public and of course that means to the international public but it's exciting because uh, of course because of where it will be going but it's also I think very exciting because of the international cooperation that's involved and that's really one of the main themes I think of uh, of space travel is that the more you can do it uh, with international cooperation to achieve kind of responsible uses of, uh, of space exploration, the better it is. In your opinion, um, what is the, why those countries which are not familiar with space industry also uh, contribute to the space exploration? What is the value of it? Every country has something to offer, mm -hmm. and uh, both in terms of what they learn and in, both, and in terms of what they can contribute in terms of their knowledge, perhaps a different aspect of uh, exploration that they can focus on that other countries perhaps haven't uh, focused on for one reason or another. 
So the opportunities are there really for everybody. And it's pretty obvious because so many countries um, have cooperated in this effort in one way or another. It's a grand, incredibly expansive thing. And it's really nice to see uh, the cooperation advancing as, as uh, briskly as it has been. Mm -hmm. As you said, every country has something to offer. Sure. And it's really important because space industry is quite broad and there are a lot of small sectors, maybe space food and suit like this. Exactly. So um, I want to ask now about Marsvi. Uh, so Marsvi project is also very special. We also offer something special sure. for analog mission. So you visited at Marsvi office right. earlier and I so did. you know the basics about the project. So uh, in your opinion, uh, what's your opinion about the potential of the Mars V project? I mean, I think it's a, a really interesting possibility. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was very, very interesting to visit the offices. One of the many things that really uh, impressed me about it was the enthusiasm of everybody who was there and the knowledge base of everyone who was there. Uh, some of them have studied abroad, some of them have uh, focused their studies in, in Mongolia. But they all uh, seem not only highly committed, but uh, highly excited mm -hmm. and also very knowledgeable about various aspects of this mission. So I think the possibilities are, are very interesting. There has to be different ways, I think, of, uh, of preparing for, uh, for humans to be on, on Mars. And this is one way to do it that uh, offers some interesting possibilities. The uh, U.S. also uh, building very big analog mission site and simulation base, right? Right, right, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, there's a lot of things the U.S. is doing with regard to, uh, to Mars preparations. Mm -hmm. As I said, this rover that, uh, that will be landing, it's less than 60 days away, and I could give you the exact number, but... Uh, you know, that, that mission, among other things, has equipment on it that will uh, uh, study the, the atmosphere of Mars. And obviously that has huge implications for uh, people being there. Mm -hmm. So, um, as I see, it is also very important to cooperate and collaborate inside and domestically, in the nation level. Uh, right. For example, SpaceX with NASA, like this. So how can you see the, how do you see the importance of uh, government support in small businesses in space industry. Sure, I, I mean SpaceX is a perfect, beautiful example of the cooperation of government with the private sector. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really unprecedented, I would say, uh, in the way it's being done. So uh, what we've seen is uh, several missions already going up there. I, I have to tell you, I don't know if uh, some of your Mongolian viewers uh, Follow me on Twitter, but I'm really excited about this. I've been writing about this on Twitter a lot. Mm. Um, and there are times when uh, you can see the International Space Station up there, above UB, above Ulaanbaatar. And uh, I've written about that several times on Twitter and Facebook mm. because I find it so exciting. So um, this, in those cases, in what I've seen, every time I look up there, I see, uh, I can just visualize the seven astronauts who are up there. And I, I've watched the docking, obviously, uh, on Earth, but I've watched the docking with great excitement. And the docking is indeed the docking of a space station that's been there for uh, several decades already with a SpaceX Dragon uh, rocket missile mm -hmm. that, uh, that is really developed by the private sector. So I think that's a beautiful example of uh, the kind of cooperation that's always necessary, uh, particularly in space exploration, but, but in all sectors, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, you have been in Mongolia for around two years? Correct. Um, a little less, yeah. Yeah. So, some people may wonder that how a country with only 3.5 million can carry out a giant project like Mars V. So, how would you answer this question? Oh, I think that Mongolia uh, has tremendous potential in terms of young people, mm -hmm. in terms of their education system, and just in terms of creativity and new perspectives. And I think those are the key variables that give Mongolia so many possibilities. That's one of the things that's really impressed me. I mean, as a, as a diplomat, I tend to go to a lot of universities, mm -hmm. and I've been really impressed by the, uh, by the level of knowledge and the creativity of some of the people that I've met. Um, obviously, I don't only go to universities that focus on sciences, mm -hmm. but uh, I know that in the field of STEM, which is the term we use for, what is it, science, technology, um, engineering, and math, 
uh, Mongolia is you know, doing some impressive things. And I think one of the exciting things about Mars V and generally about uh, focusing on space exploration is it, it not only gives uh, a country the ability to contribute to an international effort like uh, going to Mars, but it, you know, it really encourages people to study things like STEM education fields. I think that's tremendously important uh, because it benefits the country and it benefits the world. So uh, uh, having seen that here, not only with regard to the possibility of, of space, but things even like artificial intelligence, um, I'm really very, very impressed. Mm, thank you so much. So maybe there's something you want to talk and I couldn't ask from you. And it is oh. especially uh, first of January and first day of the year. So stage is yours if you want to oh, thank you. say greetings to all. Well, indeed, um, I want to greet everybody in Mongolia. Uh, Mongolia has been incredibly hospitable and friendly to my wife and me, and we've had a fantastic time. But even more important than that, I, uh, I'm very, very optimistic about Mongolia. Um, I'm excited about this country, and it's partly because of uh, education and creativity that I've seen here. So wishing everybody a very happy 2021. Mashik Bayertla, thank you. <laughs>
uh, importance to look towards the future. Mongolians have established the Mongolian Air Space, the Research and Science Station to rise side by side with the rest of the world, to use the united ambitions to create greatness, to solve the common issues around the globe, to give to the world the Mongolian know-how to survive in an environment with very limited resources, to access the Gobi Desert's Mars-like futures and present it to the world. Together, we will bridge mankind's wishing to reach Mars. Mars for everyone. Mars and Earth International Digital Conference. Mars V. Thank you everyone for staying with us. I hope 2021 will be a good year. And may our all New Year resolutions come true. So let's all thrive towards progress. And Mars, Mars for everyone. everyone! Happy New Year!